postulate that I see. I apologize. I got it now. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the last oh. part is. Uh, yes, it's not your computer. It's, it's... Oh. Um, I yeah. might ask you for your slides. It's okay, second, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the last part is that we'll postulate um, that in the absence of spontaneous symmetry breaking, the slow degrees of freedom for um, the hydrodynamic effect of field theory will be the local densities of conserved quantities like charge or energy, et cetera. That's a sort of physical postulate that any other degree of freedom would have a finite lifetime. And so it's sufficiently long time scales that can be neglected. But since we can't teleport around like in Star Trek, okay, the local densities of conserved quantities will be arbitrarily slow degrees of freedom on sufficiently long scales. Okay, so let's first ask, so using this sort of uh, technology that I've reviewed, what is the hydrodynamic EFT for a single conserved uh, charge? So Q is the integral of, of a density rho, and what do we find? Okay, uh, from this sort of EFT perspective, uh, since we want to assume time reversal symmetry, uh, this is like, I give you, you know, some Markov chain uh, for interacting particles. The number of particles is conserved. If I want this system to be microscopic uh, time reversal symmetric, this is going to be a symmetry I have to incorporate in my, in my Lagrangian. But we've seen that in order to incorporate time reversal symmetry, I have to specify the steady state that I'm relaxing to. If I don't know the steady state, then it's very non-trivial to... Well, it's both annoying to check if I have time reversal symmetry, and we also can't really build an effective field theory, um, at least not in a nice way that I know. So I'm going to postulate that for this diffusing system, the steady state um, is basically a sort of featureless Gaussian. Um, this is kind of like a central limit theorem. You know, I look at each little box of my fluid, and there's many particles, so on average, I see the same amount in every box. Okay. This parameter chi is a susceptibility, which should be positive so that this system is stable and not unstable. All right. Um, in addition to, to sort of postulating this steady state, right, um, within hydrodynamics, we have a conservation law for the total charge. This turns out to um, demand a kind of particular symmetry where our Lagrangian needs to shift by a total derivative if we shift pi in a particular way. I won't derive this rule for you, but it's kind of uh, analogous to the Hamiltonian frame, framing of Nether's theorem. Yeah. So, so rho is in the macroscopic quantity or? Yeah, so rho is the sort of coarse grained, coarse -grained slow degree, degree of freedom. freedom. Yeah. So then the permutation sets by some large deviation of the form, right? So it become not parent. Uh, sorry, for which which so, step? I mean, you, you probability, you phi describe your probability, which is e to the minus phi, the steady state. Right? But it, it mm -hmm. could be some kind of derivation form, right? So rho should be almost surely a certain quantity with small fluctuations. Yeah, so rho is almost, is very close to zero. Um, you know, it, so you have yeah. a, you can implicit that parameter in there. Right? So, so you say that the probability is e to the minus. Yes, yeah, okay, so phi, so the probability in the steady state is e to the minus phi. So phi, so this is basically saying I have Gaussian fluctuations around zero density. I'm just I'm wondering, so thermodynamics describes more than just the Gaussian fluctuations, the whole large deviation form. So you, yeah, okay. So you could you could add further nonlinearities to phi if you wanted. Um, yeah, I, I won't do that here, so but here in principle here. you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, mathematically, the, the perspective I'll also take in this discussion is that sort of, you know, first I just specify phi exactly, it is what it is. It's some, you know, continuum approximation to a more complicated thing. And, you know, then we can ask at the very end, you know, do we have sort of relevant corrections, you know, depending on whether we add perturbations or not. Okay. Anyhow, so with these rules, um, you're actually extremely constrained on what terms you're allowed to add to the MSR Lagrangian. So uh, sort of the leading order term you can add is this term in red. 
Uh, so we have, we need to have X derivatives acting on pi because of this uh, shift symmetry. So if pi shifts by a constant, that has to leave uh, basically this red term unchanged. By time reversal symmetry, we need to have pi and pi uh, minus i mu or i pi plus mu. Uh, they have to come in pairs like this because time reversal will flip the roles of the two terms. And that's it. So this is the simplest thing you can write down. Question? Yeah. So, so can you include uh, non local effects as well, replacing whatever pi by some correlation kernel, for instance? Is that irrelevant? So, uh, it depends on the powers that you choose. I mean, if you picked, for example, uh, grad rho squared, that would be a very big effect. Um, but, and, and how would that be a big effect? Well, this parameter mu would become Laplacian of rho instead of rho. Um, so that's going to sort of qualitatively change the universality class that you're that you're looking at. I, I would say that yes, in principle, you can add non-locality anywhere you want in some sense, but whether or not there's a kind of, you know, in some cases, I haven't thought through how controlled any kind of RG type analysis would be. But in principle, there's no obstruction. This is sort of a very flexible framework. And if you wanted to describe the density and a current that are connected. I'll talk about that and then okay. momentarily. Yeah, yeah. You can add more degrees of freedom. And, but that, it becomes nonlinear, right? Because you, you'll have J squared over rho. Rho is... I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk... Well, I'll at least sketch the Navier-Stokes equations from this perspective as well. Yeah. Um, although I won't write out all the nonlinearities, but they're there. Uh, okay. So how is it different from the double degrees of freedom? So, okay. I didn't want to sort of talk about the... So the high-energy theorists basically use a different language for more or less the same physical conclusions at the end. Um, the mapping to their language is that this field pi is phi a, and what I'm calling mu here is partial t phi r. So um, then the KMS symmetry becomes time reversal symmetry. So, yeah. Okay. This, this is, I think, a simpler... Uh, Explanation. Yeah. The mu is distant from rho. Like, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so mu is pi inverse times rho. It's basically the derivative of pi with respect to rho. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in this case, uh, Hong Liu approach that you have been using, then the pi then the pi r. Yes. Uh, yeah. So rho is not a linear map. Yeah. So there's a nonlinear map, uh, basically from mu to rho in general, and that nonlinear map would need to be undone to map it to Hong Liu's. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's the Lagrangian for, for our hydrodynamic system. I've just expanded out the pi and i mu term um, like this. To sort of deduce the nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, you vary the action with respect to pi and you get this result. So here we get, you know, if sigma depends on rho, we get a nonlinear diffusion equation. Um, in blue, I won't fully explain the step, but we add noise. The noise correlations are read off from the quadratic terms in pi, at least for Gaussian noise. Uh, but cubic terms in pi are non-Gaussian corrections. Um, so the noise correlations look like this, and there are a few comments that that I think, you know, there are aspects of hydrodynamics that may feel ad hoc to you from, from kind of the traditional Landau derivation that maybe feel slightly less ad hoc from this perspective. So first, um, the path integral should be well behaved, which means that the imaginary part of the Lagrangian needs to be non-negative. And that's going to replace um, maybe a slightly more or less, depending on perspective, ad hoc postulate, the conductivity has to be a non-negative number so that the second law of thermodynamics is obeyed. Here, the argument's going to go the other way. We're going to try to derive the second law from, from this Lagrangian. Okay. And I'll say a few more words about that later. All right. Uh, the stability of the thermodynamics also fixed chi to be positive. And kind of combining everything we see above together, 
Uh, first, we have an Einstein relation, right? Diffusion constant is sigma over chi. More importantly, we also get the fluctuation dissipation theorem, okay? So the noise correlation here uh, comes from the same sigma, right, that enters the dissipative constant. And this is completely general. It, I didn't have to assume anything about phi. Phi doesn't have to be beta H. I always have this FDT. Okay. Just a comment. There's similar kind of uh, targeted approach in glasses looking at, you know, in the 80s, people you tried to use MSR uh, sort mm -hmm. of phenomenologically to drive the kind of equations I did. And about 10, 15 years ago, um, Alexandrov uh, and Borobli Bucho uh, looked at this more rigorously, and they claimed that there was a violation of time reversal symmetry in the action, which led to a violation of the fluctuation dissipation. You have to be more careful. So it's sort of consistent with this mm -hmm. cascading of relations that you have. It, it can send you the paper if you're interested. Sure. And it, it really does. I mean, yeah, you have to be very careful to make sure that the action in your path integral really satisfies time reversal symmetry. So Okay, yeah, I mean, I would say that there was, um, I think I commented before that like you, there's an operator ordering issue that I, I sort of said I'm gonna neglect and I, I suspect this is also what they're talking about. Yeah, so from the fokker pint perspective, you can address this, it's not a, it's not a problem. Uh, I would argue that for field theory, you can always pick a discretization that, that avoids this operator ambiguity. And so I think for field theory, it's okay to just, you know, bulldoze through with MSR. But actually for finite- well, I don't think they were saying MSR was wrong. I think they were saying the workers in the 80s applied MSR incorrectly. I see, okay. Uh, but that you do have to be very careful about time reversal symmetry, otherwise you violate FTT. Yeah, that I would agree with. Well, yeah. you would need to know your uh, stationary distribution. Yeah, okay. Anyhow, uh, so now let me- I'll just say a few words about how to derive the Navier-Stokes equations in this way. It's, it took about an hour and maybe about two hours in my class, so you can read all the details in the notes if you're interested. Uh, but, okay, now I want, let's say, system with uh, conserved mass, momentum, and energy. Um, I also will not talk about angular momentum conservation, but that's there too, and that does pose constraints. For fluids that are in thermal equilibrium, um, the phi that you should choose is very particular. It should basically be minus the entropy. Okay? And now we can use the first law of thermodynamics to write all these funny mu's that I was introducing in terms of more conventional variables like temperature. Uh, this nu here is chemical potential and V is velocity. Okay? Under time reversal symmetry, G flips sine, rho and epsilon do not. Okay, that makes things a little more exciting. Okay, so as in the diffusive case, uh, the presence of conservation laws requires that pi, um, other than these kind of first few terms, has to show up with derivatives. Okay, this guarantees that we have conserved quantities. And our goal is to calculate, you know, to predict from the effective field theory, what terms can we put in the mass current what terms can we put in energy current and what terms can we put in the stress tensor? So essentially we want to deduce the constitutive relations for hydrodynamics. You might naively guess that, well, you can put whatever the hell you want, uh, like, okay, up to rotational symmetry, J could be proportional to the momentum times some arbitrary function, okay? However, uh, if we make the most general choice possible, we're gonna run into a lot of problems, okay? First and foremost, uh, for an ordinary fluid, we should have time reversal symmetry. So we need to demand that when we do this pi to minus pi plus i mu transformation, we need to make sure that the Lagrangian doesn't change up to a total derivative, okay? And that total derivative will actually be precisely at the ideal fluid level of conserved entropy. And using the thermodynamic identities and you know, just a bit of annoying algebra, you can actually calculate that the thermodynamic relations are completely fixed up to a single function, which you can identify as pressure. Okay. And here I have not assumed Galilean symmetry. I'll talk about that in two slides. So 
this P can be an arbitrary function of V squared, epsilon, and rho. All right. I have to work more to include boundaries in your explanation because they don't have to go and derivative. I am not talking, yeah, I'm explicitly neglecting boundary conditions for this talk. Um, for what it's, I mean, I haven't thought carefully about whether boundary conditions are even important or not. I, I yeah, uh, but I'm not considering. It. I, I would sort of expect that if you're interested in local physics, it shouldn't really do very much. Although maybe somehow there are constraints on boundary conditions that, that haven't, haven't been thought about. Okay. Um, so we can add dissipative effects now. It's again, the same game as before. I mean, it's really annoying because there's so much crap here, but you can do it. Uh, and you get this matrix of, of coefficients. Um, the A, B, C, and eta are actually dissipative. Strictly speaking, the K and J are dissipationless, um, but because of the anti-symmetry, but fine. Um, anyway, angular momentum conservation puts some extra constraints. And um, the second law effectively uh, can, can, be, can be understood as well. So this total derivative uh, that we saw before under time reversal, uh, you can show that basically when you add these kind of dissipative corrections, um, this gets a non-negative divergence. The non-negativity is basically coming from the positivity of the fluctuations of the imaginary part in the Lagrangian. Okay. So your time reversal basically constrains the central matrix or just the form of the vector? Uh, I would argue sort of both. So, right, so first we, we kind of know that this matrix is going to get transposed uh, because time reversal is gonna kind of flip the row and the column vector here. And so then if I have time reversal, oh, there, I also need to worry about a relative sign change between the, the sort of last row and the first two. Uh, but you kind of put all of those ingredients together and then yeah, time reversal symmetry uh, demanding the Lagrangian is invariant sort of forces you to write down this motif. I'm just physically yeah. trying to understand that if you have shear viscosity in your data and mm -hmm. so at that coarse grain level, you have dissipation. Yes. But you have a microscopic time reversal that you're importing. So physically, does it constrain the coefficient of shear viscosity? So shear viscosity has to be non negative. And that's coming from the fact that, right, so microscopic time reversal symmetry tells us that we have a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So in the shear viscosity, so shear viscosity comes from part of this term. We have a grad pi squared, that's noise, and then grad pi grad mu, that's the well, viscous term. The second law constraints are in those two terms. Yes. So, um, well, I guess this is related to the to the tension of cyber matrix. Yes. So cyber matrix is the school formula for the cyber matrix. Yes. The school formula immediately implies that it's Good as long as you have P to mm -hmm. symmetric So, um, could you relax that? Yeah, yeah, we, we've done this. Yeah, so you can, uh, I'll have a slide on that shortly and then I'll probably just end there. But, um, yeah, okay, yeah, so, um, okay. If you want to sort of study ordinary liquids and gases, you have a little bit more to do. So there's an additional boost symmetry uh, called Galilean invariance that you need to enforce, which basically tells you that the physics is the same in all reference frames. You can shift this velocity by a constant. It shouldn't change anything. Now, okay, I opened up Landau's you know, fluid book a, a month ago when I was preparing my lectures, and it's actually a really annoying derivation to get sort of all of these very nonlinear terms right with Galilean symmetry, the old way, okay? Well, if you're sort of willing to kind of pay the price up front to learn this uh, MSR-based approach, actually, it's a pretty straightforward thing to incorporate Galilean symmetry because it turns out that it's this linear combination of the mu's that, that gives you gradients of velocity. So now you can incorporate all of your FDTs, et cetera, in a straightforward way by just restricting, for example, uh, this matrix to only depend on this particular linear combination. Okay. And with some other constraints that, that force the mass current and the momentum to be proportional, 
you can basically reduce the standard, reproduce the standard phenomenology. So the pressure is a function of only two variables, and there are three dissipative coefficients. That's all sort of standard. All right. Now, one kind of cool thing that that we've been trying to emphasize over the past year is that this perspective that I've just sketched out does not just make sense for sort of passive thermal systems, okay? But there's really no conceptual difficulty to trying to apply the same methods to at least certain kinds of active fluids. So I'm gonna use a kind of experimental definition that an active system is something where the particles have batteries on them. So they're like birds or robots. Okay. Uh, and as long as the slow degrees of freedom are still conserved quantities, uh, like the mass density and the momentum density, there's really no obstruction to just doing this whole thing uh, for those systems as well. The steady state phi that was the entropy density before uh, doesn't need to be entropy anymore, but it still exists if, well, that's at least our postulate. If you have such a steady state, all right, you just carry this whole prescription through. And one sort of amusing feature of this framework is that this uh, framework implies that there will always be a sort of nice FDT and a nice second law of thermodynamics, at least if you express things in terms of the right variables. Okay. Now to address Ben's question, so time reversal symmetry can be broken in controlled ways. So you can study PT symmetric systems, you can study systems with spatial anisotropy. Um, there are some systems that are very difficult to describe in this language. And these are systems where the slow degrees of freedom are not only what I would describe as hydrodynamic. Uh, if you study a system like flocking, uh, then there's a sort of what I would describe as a non-hydro mode that's a non-conserved quantity, but that's a sort of slow degree of freedom. And that that's sort of harder to dis describe in this method. And Jack will talk a bit about that tomorrow. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll sort of basically skip this part, but uh, just to sort of summarize this in a nutshell, this MSR approach, if you start sort of relaxing some of the symmetries more and more, it starts to predict that new kinds of fluids should exist. Um, some of these new fluids seem to be kind of impossible in, in Hamiltonian or thermal systems. Um, they have weird anomalies but we've built Markov chains that, that sort of realize these new universality classes. So this is an example where you have a fluid with triangular symmetry. Uh, you have like a vector conserved charge, and you can see that you get these kind of propagating waves that are kind of like gravitationally anomalous uh, systems. So anyway, these are novel anomalies in two plus one dimensions um, that, that might be interesting. Okay. Uh, let me just sort of post my conclusions and thanks for your attention. All right. Let's see. So physically, uh, the beginning you're adding noise essentially to fix this time reversal symmetry issue. Is there a physical way I should understand why noise is the right thing or like what is it? So I think the physical argument that I would make is let's see. Um, so, I, okay, I think basically the, the reason noise is going to be required, right? I mean, if we didn't have noise, then uh, if we just take our sort of simple overdamped problem, then I think there's really no way to salvage time reversal symmetry. You could try to add maybe a second, like a mirror degree of freedom that, that goes the other way, but that's kind of maybe even more silly than trying to add noise. Uh, maybe as just sort of an appeal to authority, I, you know, I could say there is a fluctuation dissipation theorem. We sort of expect that that's the physical mechanism by which time reversal symmetry is captured in dissipative systems. And it's so it's sort of nice that there's an effective field theory that also builds it in in a kind of crisp. Can I, can I think about it as somehow like when, when you integrate out to the long wavelength theory that, you know, at the from a microscopic level, there is some like noise at all leg scales, but then you know part of it that goes into big M and like whatever remains at some long. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you're asking. Yeah, so maybe to explain this another way, suppose you start with this MSR Lagrangian 
and, and you have a non-dissipative system. You can also do that. It's a bit of overkill, but it can be done. And now suppose that I start integrating out degrees of freedom, you know, one at a time. The sort of philosophy that I would advocate for is that after you integrate out some very large number of degrees of freedom, you realize that sort of the effective theory that, that you should write down never loses the time reversal symmetry, but you just start adding these sort of, you know, pi, pi, pi plus mu type terms, which are allowed by the symmetry. Um, and, and that's sort of the effect of integrating those degrees of freedom out. But in this way, you don't have to think of ever losing a symmetry. It's just manifested in a sort of new way. How is that? I mean, if I if I say I have linear conserved modes when k goes to zero, which I, I can create a finite k like the energy density, mm -hmm. the momentum density, and the, the current yeah. density, and I just do memory matrix, I have an exact set of equations for those three degrees of freedom, which has an effective noise, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it has it has a noise in it, but these are Newton's equations, right? So I mean, I see that there's a, a problem. If you, so, you have ten to the twenty third degrees of freedom. There's always a fluctuating force you can write, whether or not it's removed all the slow degrees of freedom, because there will be nonlinear slow degrees of freedom too, is a separate question. But there's always going to be an effective Langevin equation for your conserved error. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I disagree. But this is sort of this is meant to be. A kind of you know an approach evoking Wilson's effective field theory that explains what the form of those fluctuations and what the form of the damping will be without having to sort of write down these memory matrix equations. Oh, I, so, I'm often yeah. saying it's trivial in any sense, and I think it's yeah. nicer. But I was saying that the idea that you sort of have a noise. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um the function that you impose at t goes to minus t and mm -hmm. pi goes to i pi uh, minus pi plus i mu. Mm -hmm. It's like if I was just working with the formula combination, I would have pi a of t plus i beta something and mm -hmm. then expand that. And at leading order is how it would look like the relation. Yes. yes. So if I want to include higher order corrections, how do you do So the higher order corrections in Hong Lu's formalism aren't captured in the sort of simple story I was describing today. I would argue that I'm, this is maybe sort of my personal perspective, I'm not sort of necessarily so interested in including those higher derivative corrections, in part because I think that they become important at the length scale where hydrodynamics breaks down. So at some level, I think that it's it's not obvious to me that when those terms become important, there aren't other just non-hydrodynamic degrees of freedom that I shouldn't also worry about. Then, oh, so like if we add corrections, like if we add filler and corrections to the Lagrangian, mm -hmm. uh, those would be at a different order than, say, the corrections to the transformation of size. Well, what I'm sort of, I, I think what I'm kind of at least qualitatively arguing is that on the length scale where the derivative corrections to the KMS transformation become important, there are also very likely to be like other Planckian decaying, just non-hydrodynamic modes I haven't even included in my Lagrangian, but they're just as important as these kind of funny corrections would be. So that that's sort of my argument that in the regime where hydro is going to be very well controlled is also the kind of omega, omega much smaller than T mm -hmm. limit, where T is temperature. So, yeah. Two more questions, or one, because we'll have coffee already, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. So, what, um, what is the relation with the macroscopic fluctuation here? I mean, south of the I mean, I think that this approach is basically, you can think of it as like another way of deriving NFH. Yeah. That's, that's all. So, it's it's basically trying to use sort of Wilson's philosophy to, and, and I think maybe one advantage of this approach is you have a clearer understanding of the symmetries that go into the equations. Although it's maybe not so weird for the systems I was describing today, uh, you know, when you start talking about like these fracton fluids, for example, that have more non-trivial conservation laws, it can actually get very subtle, like which dissipative terms am I allowed to write down when I start adding more derivatives? And, 
And this, this approach, approach kind of is very right. transparent in what you're allowed to write down. Um, and if you just work in a kind of land out perspective, you can make mistakes. So you make um, the, the symmetry argument up here. Yes, mm -hmm. that that would be my argument. Yeah. Any last burning question? Thanks. Let's. Yeah. Um, I want to. I want to. Uh, in connection to talk, I would like to make two comments. There's a bunch of talk, um, and there are blackboards everywhere else except for this middle section. So feel free to play out. <laughs> and the microphone is working. Now. I forgot to press the button. Okay, so we'll continue with Anton Andreev. And uh, I see there are more people, so maybe I'll just quickly recap the announcements. There are discussion spaces in the flanks, uh, extra chalk and whatever. Um, um, we'll have a lunch break, and today we have sandwiches here, so you're welcome to stay. You also will have to take the sandwich and go upstairs. There is, uh, for the speakers, for the next speaker, you know, the, the way we're doing it, we're not hooking it up. You just make sure that you're online. You can jump on Zoom and right, let's keep moving. Right. Okay, uh, thank you for the invite. Thank you for the invitation for organizing uh, this workshop and broadening the scope so I can come. Uh, my talk will not be about hydrodynamics. Um, however, it will be about kinetics of quasi-particles and superconductors, and maybe because of that, it will be of interest to people here. What I will discuss is the divine mechanism of microwave absorption in superconductors, and this mechanism is based on the inelastic relaxation time. And um, what I will uh, discuss is based on a series of works to get done together with Boris Spivak, my former student, Mike Smith, and Boris's current student, Tony Lu. Uh, and the phenomena I will discuss today are rooted in the following uh, qualitative difference between the kinetics of quasiparticles in superconductors and kinetics of normal electrons in metals. And this difference is that the density of states for quasiparticles depends on the condensate momentum Ps, and therefore, when you expose the superconductor to a microwave field, the condensate acceleration will change the density of states. So the density of states for quasiparticles will start depending on time, and this is not the case in normal metals. So to understand it, it's probably easiest to think about clean uh, superconductors, where we can label quasiparticle states by their momentum. And then the spectrum of quasiparticles has this kind of BCS form, but in the presence of a condensate momentum PS, there is an additional term, uh, which is also pro proposed to the condensate momentum and the velocity DP, which is not the group velocity of the quasiparticle, but the normal state uh, velocity, band uh, velocity of the electron, P over R. And it's the same velocity which contributes uh, to the current. So if you ask what is the current density in a non equilibrium state, then each quasiparticle contributes uh, a term charge of the electron times the normal state band velocity. So the coupling between the condensate momentum and uh, occurs via the current. So if you wish, you can think that the spectrum is formed in the frame moving with the condensate. And then when you boost to the lab frame, this term appears. So then uh, uh, because of this, you, you can uh, you think that now the energy and current the contribution of quasiparticles become correlated in the presence of the condensate momentum, and therefore the relaxation of current uh, will know something about relaxation of energy. So it will become intertwined, and as a result, you might expect that the energy relaxation time will contribute to the conductivity. Okay. Um, so now let me just review the basics about microwave absorption in normal metals and superconductors. So it's important to distinguish between the momentum relaxation time, which at low energies um, occurs from elastic scattering of electrons with impurities, and um, energy relaxation arises from electron-electron collisions or electron-phone collisions. And at low temperatures, uh, the inelastic relaxation time can be much, much greater than the elastic one. This can be several orders of magnitude, the difference. So now, uh, when thinking about um, 
microwave conductivity of metals, microwaves uh, penetrate into superconductor to skin depth, and absorption of microwaves is governed by the uh, AC conductivity. Uh, and for frequencies below the inelastic you know, elastic relaxation rate, this conductivity is basically the static through the conductivity, and we find that absorption of microwaves is proportional to the short elastic relaxation time, and the long one, the energy relaxation time plays no role. Okay, so now um, moving on to superconductors. Here we have to uh, you know, modify the expression for the current. I want to stick to the low frequency regime where frequencies will be assumed to be smaller than the gap delta. And for simplicity, I will also assume that delta is smaller than Tc, although that is not inessential. So then the leading term for the current density is just proportional to the uh, superfluid momentum Ps, instantaneous value. This uh, Ps is the gauge in there and derivative, chi is the phase of the order parameter, A is the vector potential. And in the presence of microwave fields, uh, the uh, condensate momentum satisfies this acceleration equation. And, and then um, in addition to the instantaneous relation between the condensate momentum and J, additional term appears, which is proportional to Ps dot, the electric field, and that is the conductivity sigma. So it's a correction to the superfluid current. And um, this AC conductivity was studied almost immediately, theoretically, after the advent of the BCS theory, starting with the pioneering paper by Maddox and Bardeen, and then many other people uh, followed. And uh, what I need for the purposes of my talk is that at finite temperatures and frequencies below two delta, uh, the dissipation arises not from excitations of new quasiparticles, but already from the existing thermal quasiparticles and their momentum relaxation. So the conductivity in superconductors is also proportional to the uh, elastic relaxation time. Uh, and in particular, close to TC, it's practically equal to the through the conductivity in normal method up to a small correction. So again, we see that uh, despite what I said in the beginning, uh, the inelastic relaxation time does not appear. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, in the rest of the talk, I will argue that under some conditions, um, the energy relaxation does affect the AC conductivity. And um, the, before I describe it, let me uh, first discuss the divine mechanism, uh, which leads to this contribution to the conductivity. So the divine mechanism of absorption was discussed by Peter Devine when he considered absorption of microwaves in uh, molecular gases. You see, they call molecular gases. And the essence is the following. Um, so suppose that this ugly curve is the distribution function of occupants of certain energy levels. And uh, let's say that you start with a given energy level, the height of the bar is the occupancy of the level. And if in the presence of microwaves, the, um, due to the dipole moment, the energy level start moving up and down uh, in energy space as a function of time, then an initial, uh, initially equilibrium occupancy starts, stops being equilibrium. Uh, you develop a non-equilibrium occupation. And for small frequencies and in linear order in microwave radiation, this non-equilibrium occupancy will be proportional to the electric field and the inelastic relaxation time. And then uh, you can find the AC conductivity by equating joule heat relating it to the energy production rate. And what you find is in this case, the microwave conductivity is proportional to the inelastic relaxation. Okay, so then how can it arise in superconductors? This divide contribution to the conductivity, which is proportional to the inelastic relaxation time. Uh, it can um, arise as follows. So this is a schematic picture of the BCS density of states, this one over square root singularity, the dashed line, that would be in the press, in the absence of uh, current, in the absence of um, condensate momentum. But if you uh, now has a, if you have a non-vanishing condensate momentum PS, this square root singularity becomes broadened due to depairing by the current, and the density of states kind of starts looking like this. Uh, then when you expose this superconductor to microwave radiation, the time-dependent condensate momentum will, will lead to the fact that this uh, broadening will begin to breathe with, uh, with time. 
and uh, this will generate spectral flow and its relaxation would require energy relaxation of quasi particles and therefore you would expect a contribution to the conductivity which is proportional to the inelastic relaxation time so why doesn't it arise in these classic results the reason is that the density of states is a scalar and therefore it cannot depend linearly on a vector ps it can depend only on ps squared so therefore, when you consider the time dependence of the density of states in linear order in the microwave field, it should contain another vector, um, PS dot. So therefore, in linear microwave absorption, this Debye contribution will appear only in the presence of a DC supercurrent. But in the absence thereof, it will not appear. And uh, therefore, you know, all these classic results are certainly correct. But nevertheless, uh, under some conditions, this divide contribution will appear. So let me discuss, uh, start discussing the simplest case of uniform films of superconductors uh, um, subjected to a microwave field, which is in the plane of the superconductor. So for simplicity, I will want uh, to consider a low frequency regime where both the frequency of the microwave radiation and the inelastic relaxation rate are much smaller than the the elastic one. Then in the uh, relevant uh, frequency regime, we can assume that the momentum realization of quasi-particles has already happened, it proceeds rapidly, and therefore the non-equilibrium population of quasi-particles depends only on their energy and time, nothing else. And then you can construct a very simple theory of this Debye contribution uh, to conductivity, to AC conductivity, and uh, it, the construction of this description goes as follows. So first, we uh, note that the time evolution of the density of states uh, satisfies kind of a hydrodynamic continuity equation because the number of quasi-particle states is conserved. So you can treat this uh, um, density of states as a density of 1D fluid, let's say Pichuca's gas, the levels flow up and down. And this is a continuity equation describing the conservation of Number, number of levels with a little v sub nu uh, being the level velocity. So it just tells you how fast these levels moves in average space. And this level velocity, since uh, levels depend only on the instantaneous value of superfluid momentum PS, that velocity is proportional to PS dot, the electric field, and some vector quantity, which is called the, we call it the level sensitivity. So it's, it describes the sensitivity of a given quasi-particle level to the changes of the superfluid momentum PS. So it has units of uh, linear velocity, length per time. And uh, then, uh, so that's one ingredient. The second ingredient is to describe, start describing how the occupancy of these levels depends on time. If the levels are just, the quasi-particles are just advected by this spectral flow, then this evolution is described by this continuity equation. But in the presence of energy relaxation, um, in addition to this advection, you add the inelastic collision integral. And this is the uh, kinetic equation uh, for these uniform systems. Uh, then if you solve this kinetic equation with the inelastic collision integral, you can evaluate the AC conductivity by equating uh, the let's say the work uh, or the rate of work or power done by the microwave radiation on non-equilibrium quasi-particles, averaging this over the period of the oscillation and then equating to Joule heat. Uh, I will apply this to both linear and non-linear regime. So this, when I discuss the non-linear regime, I will be defining this non-linear divide connectivity by the same point. Okay, so let me then start with uh, a linear regime. The linear regime, uh, we, will, <clears throat> we will say that our superfluid momentum um, consists of the DC part, which I will denote by PS bar, and um, a small change, delta PS, which is proportional to the uh, microwave electric field. Uh, then we can just linearize the collision integral. And the important point here is that the uh, quasi-particles that are affected by the speckle flow reside near the threshold of this energy spectrum. So it's a very narrow energy interval, as we will see. 
And as a result, uh, whereas the, if you ask what is the characteristic energy change involved in, in elastic collisions, that's a water temperature. That's a much higher scale. In this case, we can essentially only think of the out relaxation time in the collision interval, and then the relaxation time approximation becomes essentially exact. Okay, so then there's just kind of one parameter, tau inelastic, which uh, characterizes the whole scheme. And again, solving this linear equation very simply and evaluating the power, absorption power, we obtain the following general expression for this divide contribution to the conductivity. Here, it's expressed as a ratio of this divide contribution to the Drude contribution to the Drude conductivity. And you see that um, it has this large ratio of relaxation times, tau inelastic to tau elastic. Then there is a uh, characteristic Lorentzian dispersion uh, in frequency, which proceeds at very small uh, frequency scales uh, associated with the inelastic relaxation rate. And the rest is some dimensionless integral, uh, which only um, knows about the density of states at the DC superfluid momentum Ds and its sensitivity. So then the, the message is that if you know the dependence of the density of states on PS, you have this very general result. Uh, it, so this formula um, kind of looks scalar, but this result only applies to the longitudinal geometry in which the electric field is parallel to the superfluid momentum. Um, and in the transverse geometry, uh, Basically, the modulus of super momentum doesn't change, it only counts. So, this conductivity is absent. So, this is, uh, in, in, in other words, the divide contribution is uh, strongly anisotropic, even in isotropic conductors. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing I want to say is that this formula applies to any disorder strength, any type of uh, bearing symmetry for superconductors. It's really all hidden in the density of states. So, we have uh, this considered it both for S wave and D wave superconductors. I will not discuss this D wave case, which was treated here, but stick to the S wave case. So for S wave superconductors, again, let, let me, let's think of this PCS one over square root peak. Uh, in the presence of a DC superfluid momentum, uh, this peak becomes broadened, and, but the magnitude of broadening and the shape depend on how dirty the superconductor is. And uh, broadly speaking, one can distinguish between two extreme regimes. The first we call ballistic. Uh, um, in the ballistic regime, the magnitude of the broadening, which is given by uh, V Fermi PS, uh, must be greater than the elastic relaxation rate for the quasiparticles in this relevant energy interval, which is energy dependent. So as a result, the criterion of applicability of this ballistic approximation is this uh, kind of delta V Fermi PS squared, so PS tau elastic squared. So uh, I want to emphasize that it, it just, it's not enough to have a clean superconductor. Delta tau elastic is a criterion of dirty versus clean superconductor. But in addition to realize this ballistic regime, one must have sufficiently large broadening V Fermi PS. And in the opposite regime, diffusive case, uh, it corresponds to this parameter being much smaller than one. Uh, and in this regime, the magnitude of broadening is uh, smaller than the uh, relaxation, elastic relaxation rate for these quasi-particles. So this diffusive regime can be realized at small pair breaking in both clean and dirty superconductors. Uh, but this you have to, the ballistic one, you have to work hard with. So this orange line corresponds to this ballistic regime, blue line, Okay, so now let me start with the ballistic case. Uh, in this case, uh, the broadening interval is basically V Fermi PS bar, and uh, this ratio uh, sigma divided to sigma Trude is um, this formula, same uh, general prefactor, tau inelastic over tau elastic, Lorentzian scale. And then there are two uh, kind of small parameters, delta over t, which is assumed small in this uh, interval, and also V Fermi PS, pair breaking over delta is also small. But the smallness of this parameter can be compensated by this large ratio, and therefore this divide contribution can exceed the to the conductor. 
Okay, uh, for uh, dirty in the uh, finite disorder, you have to solve the Gorkov uh, equations. Um, uh, so you, generally you get the quintic equation for the density of states. And in the two limiting regimes, ballistic regime, it, this quantic equation reduces to bi-quadratic. And in the diffusive regime, it becomes a cubic equation, um, which also follows uh, uh, from the Uzadel equation. So if you had from the start assumed dirty superconductors, where delta tau, tau elastic is small, uh, and use the Uzadel equation, you get the same result. So for the diffusive equation, diffusive regime, uh, this ratio is the following. Um, the, the three factors are the same, but what is different is the dependence of this divide contribution on the DC superfluid momentum PS bar. Uh, note that it's still non-analytic. It goes as PS bar to the power of four thirds. Whereas in the ballistic case, it's um, square root of uh, PS bar. Uh, and here I want to uh, comment on um, on this first paper. The first people who discussed the contribution to the conductivity of superconductors proportional to the inelastic relaxation time are Akchinikov and Isakyan. And uh, they uh, got a result that goes as PS square. And the reason is that because they treated the Uzadel equation with their breaking term, which is diffusion coefficient times PS bar squared determinatively. But uh, the point is that because the relevant energy interval uh, of quasi particles that are active in microwave absorption is near the square of singularity, the derivation theory cannot be used. And that's, so we believe our results is right. And that's the reason for the discrepancy. Okay, so has this been uh, seen uh, in experiment? Uh, possibly, uh, so there's a recent experiment at MIT in the group of Carl Berger. Uh, this is a microwave guide. They wanted to use, I, mean, I think it's a device that is, uh, there are uh, radiation detectors uh, which are used in uh, transition edge, kind of, um, in superconductors tuned to the transition between normal uh, and uh, superconducting state by DC current. That's why they needed to characterize the microwave impedance in the presence of a DC current. So this is a uh, quote from their paper. I find it, sorry, this is a schematic of the device. That's a micrograph. You can't really see it. This is about three microns. Um, and now at finite current, the measured sheet resistance is several orders of magnitude larger than the theory would suggest. The theory was based on mattis bardeen elastic relaxation time. And also I want to uh, uh, note that the sheet resistance is basically the real part of the impedance. Here, D is the film thickness. And uh, now the real part of the impedance is actually proportional to the real part of conductivity. The sigma one is the real part. Sigma two is the imaginary part, which is related to superfluid density. So the impedance is proportional to the uh, conductivity. And so that's the graph. That is the, the red line is the theory line. It's a, a this, sorry, I've got to say it's niobium nitride, T over TC is 0.2. And that's the theory. And these are the data. Um, and, uh, okay, so maybe this is a device uh, uh, Um so then, um, uh, briefly, nonlinear. Uh, in the nonlinear regime, you get this uh, divide contribution even in the absence of the DC current, and by order of magnitude, you can just take the linear results and replace in them the DC superfluid momentum PS bar with its AC amplitude. And roughly speaking, you get uh, the right order of magnitude. Uh, more precisely, here are the expressions. So you see the scaling with the power, uh, with the amplitude of the microwave field is the same as uh, with the power of PS bar in the ballistic regime. Uh, maybe one, uh, one can ask: Do you, do you need actually DC current, or uh, can this divide contribution arise in more under more general settings? And so strictly speaking, you don't need a current. 
uh, for linear conductivity, all you need is a polar vector that breaks time reversal symmetry. And therefore, so this time reversal symmetry breaking can occur spontaneously or not. So in particular, you can induce uh, this time reversal symmetry breaking by applying an inflame magnetic field. However, it's a pseudo vector, so you need to convert it to a polar vector. So because of that, you need a non central symmetric superconductor. And one model that we uh, discussed is a uh, uh, non central symmetric su superconducting film with spin orbit coupling. Uh, in this case, um, uh, there is also a, um, a so called magnetoelectric effect or Edelstein effect, which means that even in the absence of a current, there is a gradient of the order parameter phase. So the condensate momentum does not vanish in the absence of supercurrent because of linear terms in the Dinbrook Landau. However, you cannot just mindlessly take this DC uh, sub cooling momentum, put it into our formulas, and get the result. Uh, it's more involved. Uh, let me just not discuss it. So it's a mi microscopic model where, because of spin orbit coupling, you split the two Fermi surfaces according to their helicity. Then apply an in-plane field, uh, and same uncoupling distorts the Fermi surfaces, and you compute a bunch of diagrams, and kind of get um, the same results. That now these the in-plane magnetic field H plays the role of that vector that breaks um, time symmetry. All these scalings are the same as in the uh, case of DC superfluid momentum. The anisotropy. Uh, on the relative orientation between the microwave field and H depends on two things, on whether you have Rajbal or Zeman coupling, but basically it's the same longitude of geometry. And uh, then finally, maybe just as an advertisement, say that uh, we also consider non-uniform systems, so in particular SNS junctions. Here, if you have uh, the density of quasi-particles and their quasi-particles in the normal region depends on the order parameter phase difference. You under drive, this phase difference evolves with time that causes spectral flow in the normal region and ensuing the virilization. And because of that, uh, there appears to be a low bias regime in SNS junctions where the Conductance is actually much higher than it would be kind of in the normal case. So if you have a voltage bias, the, the ID characteristic is uh, N shape, and the current is actually quite high. And for current bias, in addition to this kind of normal, you might think that going from high bias, you go into this uh, critical current, but there is also a foot uh, with much uh, lower voltages or much higher conductances. And this regime is controlled by the devaluation. Uh, and so this um, probably a related phenomenon was seen in uh, an old experience by the group of Tinkham, where they considered not SNS junctions, but uh, weak links uh, where superconductivity was suppressed. And you, this is current voltage, and you see that you uh, lower the bias current, and then instead of going to zero, there's a very long foot. Um, so this may be also related to uh, this device. And now the very final thing is that um, if you consider microwave absorption in the vortex lattice state, suppose we have a film with a bunch of vortices in it, here you already have a PS, a superfluid velocity in ground state. So in principle, this device mechanism can be at work. However, um, if you have a symmetric vortex lattice, then because of this asymmetrical symmetry of the distribution of the current, actually you get sort of cancellation of the velocity at any uh, at any energy level. Uh, whereas uh, because of pinning, this uh, distribution of superfluid momentum gets distorted and asymmetric. And therefore the particles that are trapped in each vortex, if you apply an external microwave field that further distorts this distribution that causes spectral flow of quantum particles and uh, um, microwave absorption is important to the um, elastic, long elastic realization. So uh, let me then uh, just uh, post the summary. The summary. Um, so we discussed this Dubai contribution to the conductivity, which is proportional to the long inelastic relaxation time. It's an isotropic. Um, can arise in the absence of superfluid current uh, in the presence of um, 
provided there is time versus symmetry breaking. So this might be um, useful to identify unconventional superconductors which break time versus symmetry uh, using microwave techniques. Also, uh, this um, microwave absorption can be used to measure the, this elastic relaxation time in superconductors, which is kind of difficult to do. And the final comment I want to make is that uh, the by contribution violates Matthewson's rule. Here, not resistivity is added, but conductivity is added. I do have a question. So can you go back to the experiment that you showed from MIT? I didn't know exactly what I was supposed to take between the comparison theory and experiment. Is this your theory with the inelastic component, the red line? No, no, no. Okay, this was a okay, that theory was done by um Clem. So it's, it's basically magic bardeen, uh, but modified uh, to a finite current by basically uh, evaluating how the gap suppression is affected by the DC current that is a weak dependent, but still the basic fact that the conductivity is proportional to the elastic relaxation time is built into that. Field. So it's in the point. So the point is that the discrepancy here points out that the inelastic contribution is that's what we call for. Yeah. So we don't yeah. know what the relaxation time is, but it can be right. like six orders of magnitude uh, that ratio. Or that could be. Uh, no, Mike is this one, right? Yeah, I think I'm uh, just going to add your audio. Yeah. Oh, did that point work? Yeah, I, should. I, just, I tested it earlier. So it should... I think it's not to turn off. I know. Uh, that's yeah. tiny, though. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just use that as a clicker. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll just use this. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me and uh, Coming to this talk, I'm a bit surprised that there are so many talks on fluctuating hydrodynamics. And uh, I guess this work that I'm about to tell you is uh, kind of in that same vein, though, uh, perhaps a slightly more pedestrian version, uh, where we've been trying to understand how um, thermal noise uh, measurements and noise thermometry uh, effects uh, are different in these electron hydrodynamic systems. So, this work. So uh, just before I begin, uh, let me just comment that uh, you know this has really been an ongoing work. Now we have you know a couple of papers out. Uh, you know we've been working with Philip Kim's group, who has been really pushing forward uh, these experimental techniques of noise thermometry uh, in various materials, and then also you know I've been working with Brian on the theory side to develop um, how this all works. So uh, let me just quickly recap for you how. A uh, noise thermometry works. Uh, so you imagine you have a finite, con uh, sorry, you have a conductor here being held at a finite temperature, and of course, because it's being held at a finite temperature, the electrons are going undergoing uh, noise fluctuations, and you measure some kind of uh, noise in the ammeter down here. That's given to you as uh, was expressed many times earlier today by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is also known as Johnson Nyquist in this particular context which gives you a relationship between this uh, you know, current current correlator and, a, and the temperature, and the, which is then also divided by the resistance, right? So uh, what this means practically is that if you rewrite um, this noise in units of temperature by these prefactors, which we call the Johnson noise temperature, uh, you precisely measure the ambient temperature by doing a noise measurement. So okay, let me move this. Oh, that's not for me. Um, no, and you can you can move it on the other side. Uh, right. Yeah, there's no as far as possible. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so uh, right, so the the principle of noise thermometry is just the fact that if you measure noise, you can say something about the electron temperature. 
Now, of course, uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, in this form, the simplest thermometry, uh, uh, thermometry setup requires you to be in thermal equilibrium. And so, uh, so we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so uh, let me just comment on why you might want to use noise thermometry in the first place. So there have been a number of uh, really cool applications and experiments that have been done using this technique. So one such uh, thing you can do is known as bolometry or the measurement of electromagnetic radiation um, on a device here. So you, know, you just have some uh, light shining on your device. And uh, nowadays, uh, as uh, recent as 2020, they can measure photons down to the single photon uh, level now. Um, you can also do uh, thermal transport uh, with uh, noise thermometry. Um, so particularly with uh, devices that have weak electron phonon coupling, um, this type of, and your interest in the electronic component of thermal conductivity, this becomes uh, very advantageous because you know your normal phononic thermometers and phononic thermometry techniques uh, don't couple very well to the electronic part. Whereas the uh, noise thermometry allows you direct access because it's a all electrical technique. Uh, so people have been using this for graphene, carbon nanotubes, alpha erythrium chloride, things like this. Um, and so part of the reason that Brian and I were uh, interested in uh, kind of revisiting this problem of uh, noise thermometry for hydrodynamic systems was, well, back in 2016, this uh, uh, seminal uh, experiment where they're measuring vitamin Franz violation in graphene as uh, one of the early signatures of electron hydrodynamics. Uh, was precisely done using this, uh, you know, thermal transport noise thermometry technique, right? And kind of the the strange thing about the analysis of that data to interpret the thermal conductivity here was that they just extended um, the what the theory that was known for ohmic devices, and they said, uh, you know, this is telling us something about a hydrodynamic regime, where really they should be using a hydrodynamic hydrodynamic theory of noise for the hydrodynamic regime, right? And uh, I guess rather than just uh, focusing on the negative here, one thing I want to um, emphasize and I hope I'll convince you is that uh, noise, the hydrodynamic devices are actually uh, very good for this uh, noise thermometry task. So this is kind of cool because people have been working so hard to make these electron hydrodynamic devices and you know it'd be nice to have some practical application. Okay, so just to come back to this issue of thermal equilibrium, all these experiments I've described to you require you to be in, in some kind of driven setting. So the temperature in general will not be uniform in your device. And so you need to update the fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, to account for this. So the, the basic uh, principle is listed here in three steps. You We're going to heat the system. Uh, so in this, uh, for our purposes, uh, we'll just imagine this is going to be the, by applying a voltage or a current bias in your system. This leads to some heating in the device. And because the system is now hotter, this changes the amount of noise you measure because it's, you know, the noise is a measure of uh, some kind of temperature. So, so here, if you apply a voltage, you might expect uh, temperature profiles like this. So here it's hot in the center and then it's cold out these contacts because we're assuming that the metal uh, is a good heat sink. So it's colder out here. And then for this funny geometry, same thing. And so with this kind of temperature profile where- This, this yeah. reaches a steady state. Yeah, in steady state, steady state. Yeah, uh, right. So with this kind of temperature profile, you measure the noise and the noise, again, measures some kind of temperature. So somehow it's taking some kind of uh, funny weighted average over you know, this non-uniform temperature. And so this particular problem was studied uh, by a number of people uh, starting back in the 90s or so. Uh, for ohmic devices. So they're assuming uh, some J equals sigma E Ohm's law relation. They're assuming Wiedemann's Franz law, so universal uh, proportionality between kappa and sigma. And they find uh, a pretty nice result here. So the increase in noise is given to you by power, uh, resistance, Lorentz ratio, and temperature. And then there's this universal prefactor uh, 112. And the reason I call this universal is because that this result it doesn't depend on the specifics of the two terminal geometry for both this device and this funny device. That that's always the result. Yeah. So we're assuming no escape of heat. Yeah. So I'm assuming no escape of the only way heat can leave from the system is through the contacts. So we're assuming, uh, you know, heat leakage due to phonons, etc., like coupling to the substrate. All of that is uh, ignored in this theory. Right. So right. So th if this is the ohmic result. 
um, you know, one can ask, you know, what might change in the hydrodynamic case? And one of the first things you might a question is this geometry independence, right? Generally, when you have, you know, a Navier-Stokes type equation, you have viscosity, you have boundary conditions, you worry a lot about the geometry of the problem. So this uh, geometry independence of this result immediately becomes somewhat suspect. Um, a second thing um, that uh, you might ask is, well, we have a Lorentz, this universal Lorentz ratio here, and well, we know in hydrodynamics, it's not gonna take that value. Uh, one simple thing you could do is just, you know, update that to whatever the hydrodynamic value of the Lorentz ratio should be. And if that's true, this uh, leads to a practical advantage of um, hydrodynamic materials for this task. Uh, because uh, generically speaking, if you have uh, strong electron-electron interactions, this degrades my thermal conductivity, but because they're momentum conserving, it doesn't degrade the electrical conductivity. So they generally decrease L. And so for a fixed input power, if I decrease the L, the signal I get, which is this, uh, uh, this noise, uh, will be much enhanced. So you have an improved signal to noise ratio for this uh, uh, noise temperature measurement. Okay. So great. So, yeah. Oh yeah. So right, right. So so in this, so for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume Galilean invariance. So I'm imagining graphene graphene away in the Fermi liquid regime away from charge neutrality. Right. A uh, good question. Okay. So right. Um. So to to understand and compute how this noise uh looks, uh, we need to. Uh, we're going to do this in two steps, the first one being much simpler than the second. First, you need to figure out what exactly is the temperature profile in the device and how that differs between the ohmic and these uh, the hydrodynamic regimes. And then once you have that temperature profile, which is setting the strength of my the noise everywhere in my sample, I need to figure out how to essentially do a weighted average and convert that in the noise to the noise that I measure in my contacts. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this first step. So, okay, so uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to refer to hydrodynamics uh, as this uh, equate, or I'm gonna to refer to this equation where the hydrodynamic regime, uh, just for simplicity, is when the viscosity term is large. So, um, so of course, when you solve this equation um, in the ohmic limit, when viscosity is small, you get a rectangular flow profile. And then when the viscosity is large compared to uh, the momentum relaxation, you get a parabolic or Purcell profile. And of course you can tune between these two limits. This is controlled by what's called the Gurji length. Um, it's a length scale that essentially tells you the effective range of these uh, viscous effects. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, it's the same person, it's a different, it's different. Yeah, yeah. Gurji effect has to do with the temperature dependence of, of all these things, right? Okay, so um, right. So once we have these flow profiles, you can ask, you know, how, what is the uh, temperature in these uh, profile in these two regimes? And so in both cases, this will be described by a heat equation. So that's given here by some heating term Q, and this turns out to be different in the two cases. So let me just remind you what happens in the ohmic case first. So you get, uh, so the heating here is gamma U squared. You should just think of this as I squared R heating, right? And U is, I, U is the same as I. And so for a rectangular geometry, um, you know, this heating is just uniform. So no matter what the aspect ratio of my rectangle is, you always get a parabolic profile. Now, friction, of course, works very differently in the hydrodynamic regime because friction is being triggered by viscosity here. And viscosity depends on you know, velocity gradients. It depends on the stress in your liquid. And so uh, if, you, if you look at where the heating, uh, what the heating looks like for this kind of profile, uh, it's greatest near the boundaries, right? Where the you know, derivative of U is maximal and it's going to be minimal near the center and indeed zero along the center line. So this immediately leads to a, a geometry dependent heating profile you can see here. So this is a very thin and skinny one by 40 rectangle. It's roughly parabolic, looks very similar to the ohmic case. But the moment I fatten up my device, so one by one, so the current here is always flowing from left to right. 
So you see here the, uh, the emergence of these two temperature uh, maxima at the boundary, and then you have a minimal, or it's lower in the center. Okay, right. This is the leading order oh so this is so for this this is in the limit where i setting the gamut moment relaxation to zero so if you turn on momentum relaxation you'll essentially interpolate between these two pictures yeah um so here viscosity is like a no, so I'm so this is all for right now. We're just thinking of this all phenomenologically. So it, it of course it'll um, viscosity can be calculated some microscopically, but we don't really care where it comes from for the purposes of this talk. Right, right. So, right. So we we cover the geometry dependence of this thing. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I would expect if there's also convective also heat, right? Because uh, the current and your picture is kind of similar to Yeah, yeah. So we're we're also so we're ignoring all convective effects for because we we're we're assuming we're working for these materials, we're assuming viscosity is very large, right? So, uh, and so the Reynolds numbers are very small, or we're working with Reynolds numbers that are very small. So all these convective things uh, we're not worrying about for the purposes of this. Okay. Any other questions on this? All right. So, um, right. So now that we have these temperature equipped with these temperature pro profiles, we need to do the much more difficult task of um, determining how much noise we're going to measure in the contacts based on the fact that this temperature is providing for us local noise sources everywhere in the bulk. And to do this, let me go back, uh, you know, about a hundred years to this uh, result by Shockley and Remo, where they were thinking about um, electrons fl flowing in free space and like cathode ray tubes and things like this. So the question they posed is if I have this electron here moving to the right with some velocity us, how much current will I measure in the ammeter here if I set up these two gigantic parallel plates? Uh, and you know, if you're bad at electrodynamics like me, uh, when you first look at this problem, you say, well, the electrons out here in free space, it's not going through my ammeter. So um, how could I possibly ever uh, measure any current. And of course, you know, Maxwell would be really sad at you because he spent a good chunk of his life telling you that electric fields are non-local objects. And um, so of course, this the presence of this electric charge means that you have surface charges being drawn to the surface of these plates. And so if I move the electric charge, I will move the surface charges and this leads to current in the ammeter. And so the, the shockley remo results or the shockley remo theorem uh, it tells you exactly how much current you measure. Um, it's given to you by this very nice formula where you should, there's this funny term, grad psi, uh, known as a weighting potential. And it, you should really just think of this as uh, being proportional to the electric field I would get if I removed the electron and you know applied a voltage across this device. Okay, so uh, the, the point here is that the shockley remo theorem gives you a prescription to uh, get the global current that you measure in the ammeter from whatever local current there is in the bulk. Now, of course, you might uh, complain to me that you know what we really care about is conductors and not is not free space. And we know that you know electric uh, fields are screened in a conductor. You don't have this long range um, type effect. So we need to revisit this problem for the case of a conductor. Okay, so we ask the exact same question, but it turns out that even though you don't have a long range electric fields there still is a non-local effect, and that's essentially due to screening, right? The, the motion of the center charge here will drag around all its neighbors in an attempt to satisfy uh, current conservation. And this also leads to um, you know, a net measurable current in the ammeter. And how, how much current do you get? Well, it turns out by a work back by Justin Song and Leonid Levitov back in 2014, the result is precisely the same uh, as the shockley remo theorem, uh, just kind of uh, for, for somewhat subtle, but uh, also miraculous reasons. Um, so uh, just to emphasize this point that you're you should kind of think of this uh, shockley remo theorem as a, you know, converting this bulk, uh, local uh, current into the global current. Uh, here for the rectangle, specifically this grad size is just one over L. So really you're just add essentially adding up all the currents in the bulk that's how much current you measure in the ammeter. What was psi? Sorry? What was psi? Uh, psi, you should think of this as being proportional. It's a weighted version of the electric field. 
So for an, so if I just ignored everything here, if I applied a voltage across this device, it's proportional to one over L. The electric field is proportional to one over L. So, um, so the thing that we realize, and I'll come back to this point uh, later, uh, is that we need well we need to generalize this thing for the uh, the hydrodynamic or the Stokes Ohm case. So you need to uh, upgrade this equation of motion to have a viscosity here, um, and you do the hard work of solving this PDE, and it turns out it's very in a, for a very delicate reason, specifically for the rectangle, you get the exact same results. This is uh, so these this result here is generically true for any geometry, but for the hydrodynamic case, uh, this is really delicate and specific to the rectangle. And so when I talk about uh, different geometry later, we'll see how um, this effect breaks down. But for now, uh, it's the same. Okay. So right. So what I've told you so far is how to convert the uh, you know this local current to a global current. But what we're really interested in is the current current correlator. And so as uh, kind of many talks have already pointed out, you need to, there's some fluctuation in hydrodynamics you need to do. Um, this is a very, uh, you know, the textbook Landau Lifshitz version of this. Um, uh, let me not go into the details too much other than to say that this structurally, this is just the exact same uh, PD as uh, this regular Stokes Ohm equation. But in addition, you need to put in this forcing term because uh, you know, temper this the Langevin force essentially. The temperature is driving the noise currents in my device. Okay, so you know, you go ahead and solve this, and the way the where Shockley Ramo comes in is just the funny fact that one of these U's in, in here is the U of S, so it's a source versus the U, which is the total. You you just need to use this to convert this into the current correlator uh, that you want. So you you know, you go through the hard work of solving this PDE, and I'll, I'll show you. Um, what this results in uh, numerically uh, for a bit in, in a bit, but uh, just at this level, I just want to comment that viscosity is entering here into the equation of motion, and so it's going to change your results. And you know, geometry and all this thing will matter when you solve this. Okay, so right, so uh, just to remind you where uh, where we come from, we first solve for the temperature profile. Uh, you get some funny shape. You put this temperature profile into this noise and Shockley Ramo business, and you and you get the following result. So, so the only two changes to the original result for the, for the omic cases, as uh, we might have expected, you need to replace the Lorentz ratio with the, the generic hydrodynamic value, and then I've hidden all the nasty stuff into what I call F for the hydrodynamic correction, and this depends on uh, various length parameters uh, in my problem. Okay, so F uh, looks something like this. Uh, so just to walk through, you walk through this graph with you for a little bit. Uh, so down here, this is where it's the omic limit when Gershi length is small. So you recover F equals one, uh, which is if you ignore that, that's the omic result, which is great. You go to the left here. So this is when the device is very, very thin. So even if you have a very large viscosity, F is still one. Uh, and this is more or less because this picture for is, uh, the temperature profile is very similar to this picture. They're both parabolic. So when you average the temperature, you, uh, you know, it, the average is effectively the same. And that's why the two limits have the same value. So in order to get anything non-trivial, you need to go into this deep blue region here where you start getting funny temperature profiles like that. And it turns out no matter how far you go, you know, this entire parameter space, uh, that's, Three fifths as as far as you can get away from one. So uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, quantitatively, you're, you can only be at most forty percent wrong if you were naive and just ignored this hydrodynamic correction. This is all for the rectangle. This is all for the rectangle. And we'll, oh yeah, and we'll come back to this. I'll come back to this uh, yeah. when I talk about a slightly different geometry, right? So I mean, so the Krasnov all result was uh, also done in a rectangle. So and they were seeing violations that are much greater than, you know, order one. Uh, so, you know, more, they yeah, they're also near charge neutrality. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, so, I mean, you have to update, upgrade the theory to deal with that. Um, but, you know, at least it doesn't, see, it, qualitatively, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, you know, there might be some quantitative, but not super qualitative updates from this kind of thing. At, at least that's what we would expect. But the fact that it's in the hydrodynamic is in the yeah, yeah. So like, so I guess it's 
I would say that the analysis of their results was not consistent in the sense that they used something omic to say something about the hydrodynamic regime. Really, you should be using hydrodynamic theory to describe, to interpret a hydrodynamic, if that is the interpretation of the experiment, the hydrodynamic results from the, from the data. We have about five minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, well, let me, uh, uh, okay, so, okay, so yeah, so from here, uh, Right, so if f is a slow order one function, then uh, this Lorentz ratio is really what's driving a large variations in the hydrodynamic regime. So, so what as I argued earlier, if, if you can tune uh, devices to have really small L, then you can have very ultra sensitive hydro hydrodynamic thermometers. Uh, okay, so uh, in the interest of time, let me just really just advertise, I won't really have time to talk too much about the Corbino. Uh, but uh, so there was this mystery that um, uh, Philip had in his data when you apply a magnetic field to, uh, to look at resistance. Uh, and so, so here on the left, you see the electromagnetic magneto resistance. So you get the normal uh, B squared parabolic form. And that's just because when you increase the magnetic field, you know, you increasing the path length and, you know, you get a positive magnetic resistance. So this picture becomes really weird if you look at their uh, thermal magnetic resistance data, because you see here at the higher temperatures, um, it's decreasing with increasing magnetic field. Um, so they're uh, essentially asking what's going on. Uh, uh, one uh, thing that they noticed was this is kind of occurring in where one might expect to see hydrodynamics. So they were, they're asking, can electron-electron scattering give rise to a larger thermal conductivity? Um, and as far as well, we know, uh, everybody says you can't. Um, so kind of coming, com coming back to this interpretation of this results, they were essentially using, again, this omic result to interpret the thermal conductivity uh, of their data. And so, you know, we, we developed the theory to, uh, we asked, uh, you know, can this F correction uh, save the day? At the highest temperature, their electron phonon matters, right? Uh, that's right. Yes. Uh, so, so above one hundred Kelvin. So, so as far as I understand from the from their data, um, they don't they don't exact. So this is something that I don't understand super well. But it seems that their data suggests that the electron phonon coupling is like really weak, even up to like two hundred Kelvin. Like they're not really seeing right. it in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is yeah. This is something that we we are I'm trying to understand from them. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not. I'm not super. Uh, yeah. I don't really understand. Let me just leave it at that. Um, so yeah. So for yeah, they're they just ex, ex, they're seeing that the electron photon coupling is relatively weak. Uh, okay. So okay. So let me just. Uh, skip over all of this to, right, so let me just briefly advertise that um, there's some issue with the shockley ramo theorem in the Corbino geometry uh, due to something known as the Corbino paradox. Um, and it's basically the statement that in, for flow in a Corbino geometry, uh, the, the current that you get is one over R because of divergence of U being zero. But when, you, so then you have a flow with zero resistance, but then there's heating that occurs in your device. So it's kind of weird that you can have, uh, well, this, this is a, it's just a straight contradiction if you were to believe this, right? You can't, you know, where's the energy input into this the system? And so there was a series of nice works by uh, Grisha uh, Falkovich and Addy Stern which essentially said that there's going to be the sharp contact voltage drops at the at the boundary of my device, but in the bulk, you still have this uh, electric field being zero. Okay. Um, so, but this electric field being zero in the bulk becomes a problem when you try to do shockley ramo stuff, because if that were true, you plug this um, electric field into here, and this would say, that your uh, the noise that you measure or the current that you measure if you try to drag an electron here, uh, naive and you naively use this would 
I mean, there's zero noise. Never, you would never see any current um, in all of this. And so, you know, this is, of course, if this is not right, we went back and adjusted the theory. And you need to be very, essentially be very careful about solving this and treating the boundary condition in order to even get fluctuation dissipation theorem. Correct. So, um, so with that, let me just throw this, throw up this slide um, and just argue that uh, we, with this theory, you would do re indeed recover the fact that the noise, the noise decreases with magnetic field when you're in the viscous hydrodynamic regime. Um, and, and indeed it's, it's somewhat sharp. So if, when you're close to the ohmic limit, you know, you have this F equals one, or if, in fact, the noise might even increase if you start tuning away from the ohmic limit. It's only when you're sufficiently close to this, uh, uh, sufficiently close to this viscous limit that the noise will actually decrease with field. And so you can go ahead and fit this to the data that they have. Um, you can, you know, do fits. Uh, you can extract viscosity. And uh, at least it seems like this isn't completely crazy because we're in, you know, ballpark agreement with some, um, you know, transport experiments, which do this in a very different way. Okay, so yeah, with that, let me just close there. And uh, I'm happy to talk more throughout this week about all of this. What I'm missing is this excess noise or heating, right, is a phenomenon. phenomenon. Are you saying that uh, uh, Philippines technique does not allow them to stay in the linear regime in order to measure? Uh, so, uh, sorry, what do you mean by? A... I mean, linear response. Is oh yeah, yeah, Imagine. yeah. So they're assuming that, right, right. So they're assuming that the, uh, uh, it's it's per essentially perturbative. So like, um, you the there's no uh, you know you heat. So you the idea is that you can heat the device and that there's no like essentially back action. The all like, I can I'm allowed to solve like for very weak currents the amount of heating increase and you assume that you know these per these higher order perturbations don't. Uh, you know, you don't have to solve them self consistently. So that's that's the assumption we're taking here. But you're saying that we cannot stay in this linear regime assuming temperature is equal to temperature. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're driving it outside. So the assumption is that you're driving it outside of equilibrium, but uh, you're you're not. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding your question about this nonlinear. You're solving the heat spread, right? Yes. 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 So th therefore, it's that temperature deviates from. Yes. Correct. Can I not? Uh, can they measure um, temperature? Equilibrium temperature with thermostat. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so they so they can measure they can measure the like zero current bias. They can measure the the temperature if that's what you're asking. But then why do they need to worry? About oh, so the, the the reason you do this is because you want to measure thermal conductance. You don't. In order to measure a conductance, you need to drive heat into the system. Yeah. All right. Oh, uh, we'll have lunch. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe we can talk more later, Aaron. But uh, so there was a question about neglecting convection. Yes. I mean, certainly, I think that's justifiable in general. But I can imagine some maybe silly geometries like nozzles or. Yeah. I will. The you, the the convection depends on the, the amount of convection you have depends. Uh. On, okay, so there's you have to care about the Reynolds number, and then there's the advection number corresponding to um, thermal transport. So right, so like in general, you know, you need to be careful about when that nonlinear limit I is. There. Yeah, I, I think my point is like the convection can even further exaggerate the differences of flow profiles. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I, it may actually help. Yeah, I as far as my est my previous estimates of this, it's negligible, but yeah. Yeah. In in your geometry, I'm sure it's yeah. But maybe if you use them. Some crazy like yeah. nozzle. Sure. All right. Uh good time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grace Summers, are you on Zoom? Yeah. It's all good. Okay. You can share your screen. Where are you? It's somewhere. Mm -hmm. So as advertised, it's uh, 
diverse uh, scope. Yeah. So, oh. all right, good. Do you anything? You're good. I just found my call. Oh, let me move this. Oh, oh yeah. So, you might want to bring the cursor to the screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it went away. Never mind. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, this is going to be a little bit uh, perhaps different from the other talks so far, uh, but um, I want to talk to you today about uh, zero temperature entanglement membranes in quantum circuits. Um, and this is work done with my advisor, David Hughes at Princeton and our collaborators. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just this. So, right, so the motivation for this comes from the fact that uh, in the context of studying entanglement in uh, quantum many body systems, um, one way to, to understand the entanglement production is, is by thinking of it in terms of the free energy of, of a membrane, which I'll uh, define more carefully shortly. Um, and such membranes, uh, they'll, they arise naturally in the context of uh, say like a random ensemble of of say random circuits, uh, where you can do some sort of stat vec mapping um, and and get some like classical spin model and indeed like in one plus one d, this will give you a directed polymer in a random environment. Um, however, in in our work, we're interested in an individual realization of some uh, quantum many body system, particularly one that. Uh, has say like space time translation invariance. Um, and we want to know uh, to what extent can we still define an entanglement membrane and also maybe what what special features will this membrane have given the the absence of randomness. Um, so yeah, so in the rest of this talk I'll I'll define what I mean by the membrane tension and um how we can think of it in terms of dynamics flowing across a membrane and what happens when that dynamics has special properties like unitarity and time permitting, uh, I will discuss some generalizations. Right, so as shown in this, this, this figure, uh, the basic idea is say you want to know what is the entropy of this subsystem defined at some time on that blue slice. Um, so you you fed in some initial states to some dynamics. It could be a, a circuit or uh, something else. Um, and you want to know right, the entanglement of some subsystem. The idea is that this entanglement entropy is is can be given by the free energy of this, this membrane that I'm showing oscillating, uh, whose top boundary is pinned to the edge of the subsystem of interest. Uh, in this particular case, if we have like a product initial state or something, um, the the bottom boundary is is free, um, which is why I animated it. Um, and the idea is that so this this it's a domain wall between what well, one side uh, that's included in your subsystem and the other side that's uh, its complement. And in the bulk of the circuit, uh, it's an ordered phase. So um, the, right, so it really does depend on, you know, what, the entropy will depend, of course, on uh, what your boundary condition is. Um, and the idea that was sort of put forth in uh, uh, Yone et al. and following works um, is that this entropy can be just given by taking this, this minimum over basically all paths that we could have formed uh, and integrating over this line tension function E of V and then adding a contribution from the bottom initial state. Uh, so, right, so this is the basic picture uh, for some for some membrane of some coarse grained slope of V. Uh, the, maybe a first question you might ask is uh, how can I, um, like pin both ends of the membrane so I can actually determine what this E of V is. And so one way to do that um, is 
basically, so I've shown it here for like a brick work circuit, but um, the basic idea is that you're going to start with two subsystems, which are separately thermalized. Uh, so if you look at the, if, if you let X be the, the displacement from this center cut, uh, then, uh, and and let it and let S of X be the entropy to the left of that, uh, then you'll start out with just these two separate page curves um, because uh, you can either connect to the side or to the, the, the membrane can either connect to the side or to the center. Uh, then as you as you now run the full circuit, what will happen is that it will basically fill in in the center and the orange piece that I'm showing there is uh, the part of the yeah the part of the system where we know that the membrane is connecting to the to the center cut um, because that's like what will minimize the energy. Um, and so what happens is that um, in this way you can get E of V for anything uh, like within the butterfly cone. Um, right. So that's one interpretation of like what the line tension is. However, this this applies to uh, say most naturally to a unitary circuit where um, uh, where where you're looking inside the the light cone. However, you could also consider uh, like a space like membrane, and in that context, what you would be thinking about is you have some uh, you feed in a fully mixed initial state. Uh, which basically uh, fixes the boundary condition on this full system. And then you want to just know what is the, uh, you, you run the dynamics and then you ask at some later time, what is the entropy density? Um, and right, and so that will be the free energy of this domain that's separating your initial uh, and your final states. Um, and uh, in particular, we are mostly interested in various systems where uh, if you take the per particular limit of you first make the system very long and then you let time go to infinity. Uh, so this order of limits uh, is basically in that order of limits, it's saying that this membrane has to be parallel to the initial state. Um, and if, if the output entropy density uh, converges to a non-zero value in this limit, uh, call it S, then S is the free entropy density or the tension of this, this membrane. And I, yes. So I want to understand what is the total system for the spin chain and then you're evolving under some strategy. Yeah, so you can, yeah, for example, what the, the systems that we study are just like a, a brickwork or higher dimensional circuit acting on, on qubits. And what does it mean for a moving chain? Because you are cutting at different points at every uh, um, something ensemble of different cuts. Or? Uh, no, so okay, so say my question is that I'm asking what is the entropy at some time at some late time. I'm asking the entropy of some subsystem. Uh, so that's parameterized by x. So as I vary x, I'm varying the top endpoint of that of that curve. But what I'm saying is. Uh, if you consider the ensemble or something, um, then you could do this by a by a stat mac mapping. But the idea is that when you're determining what is the 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 entropy of that region, then that would be the free energy of a curve that can connect anywhere on the bottom point, whichever point it could connect to that would minimize its. So the bottom was B equal to zero. Hmm? The bottom where the point was moving was B equal to zero. Yes. For example, if you if you started uh yeah so for example in the in this case here what i've done is i can imagine that that's some that's some very very early time i started with the product state um and then it could like connect anywhere but then i ran this for a long enough time that i prepared these two page curves so in that case uh uh because it's at a long time like at that point uh, the domain wall will just like to connect to either the side of the system or this center cut where I omitted the, I basically, to prepare these two subsystems, it's like I omitted the gates along this cut. And then at subsequent times, the domain wall will want to connect to uh, either the, the sides or this center 
point right there. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. I guess the question in the next slide, when you say fully mixed initial condition, this is what do you mean? Is it an equilibrium? Oh, sorry. Is it already I, connected the bricks in the center, or oh, or? I just mean like rho is proportional to the identity. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. For infinite temperature. Yeah. Yeah. I um. Yes, infinite temperature uh, fully mixed state. Uh, right. And so the yeah. So in this case. If we converge to something in this limit, then we would be able to deduce that that is the the uh, tension of that membrane parallel to that state, uh, that initial state. And the question then is, what kind of dynamics can we have uh, if we orient some if we have some arbitrary orientation of a membrane? What are the dynamics across the membrane? Um, and so basically, the way that we organize things is sort of in increasingly general terms uh, is, so one case, which I'll discuss in more detail, is when the dynamics across the membrane is unitary within the whole Hilbert space. Um, it could also be only unitary within a subspace, or in other words, have some, like evolve some, to some permanently stable uh, steady state that has an entropy density below one. Um, and, and then it can also, if, if I have time, I'll discuss a little bit about the case where it's has like an exponentially long lived plateau. Um, but our claim is that if you have one of these first three cases where you have basically some sort of steady state that um, is not purifying any further or only purifying uh, very rarely, uh, then the free energy of this membrane, because as you increase time, the membrane has more places where it can go. But if it's if it's entropy, if the entropy is not decreasing, then it's saying that like all those places it could go isn't contributing to its free energy. Um, and so that's the sense in which it's like at zero temperature because uh, it's it only cares about the minimum uh, and the minimum energy. And for those who are, uh, yeah. So for a uh, quantum circuit. Audience, I would say that this this includes all circuit, the circuits that we study, which are composed of uh, Clifford gates. Um, then they always fall into one of these three groups. And in particular, if we enforce uh, space-time translation invariance, uh, then we get one of the first two groups, and that manifests the the zero temperature nature of the membrane manifests as a a piecewise linear uh, line tension. Right, so. To maybe get some intuition for what I mean by the dynamics across the membrane being unitary, I'm picturing in this case, uh, so a brickwork circuit of two qubit gates. Um, and so a, a patch of that circuit would look like, like this, where uh, for concreteness, you could imagine that I'm doing this in like the double Hilbert space acting on the uh, density matrix. And if this is a unitary circuit, then it'll have this light cone that I've uh, shaded in gray. Uh, and that light cone is with respect to this time direction T hat. Um, and so if the membrane falls outside, if the orientation of the membrane is something like this black line here, uh, then then with uh, then it's it's space-like with respect to this chosen time direction. And therefore we can just use the unitarity condition to evaluate what the line tension is, or perhaps in more intuitive terms, it's just the the free energy is just how many qubits are crossing this membrane. Uh, because of the way the, the line tension is defined as being per unit time, that would just correspond to E of V being uh, absolute value of V. Um, so, however, um, right, so this tells us E of V for a certain range of membrane orientations, uh, but it's perhaps the the somewhat obvious range, which is that, you know, what, what, what the page curve looks like at wait time when it just connects to the side. Um, but if we have, say, a dynamics like a dual unitary circuit, which is something that is, uh, so it has unitarity in the time direction, but also in the space direction, if we contract it that way, then what's that? what that means is that we have this other time direction, T prime, which has its own light cone. And now we can say, okay, then with respect to that light cone, 
any of these other orientations of the membrane, such as this one shown here, is space-like with respect to that. And so we can just use unitarity in that direction to uh, get what the, the membrane tension is uh, for that range of uh, velocities. And that just gives you E of V equals one. Or this form that um, I like a little bit better where we express the tension in terms of just the Euclidean length of the line of, of the membrane. I call that E tilde. Then as a function of this angle with respect to horizontal, it's just the maximum of a of the cosine theta or sine theta. So whichever whether it's closer to being vertical or horizontal. Um right. So this this case of dual unitary circuits, it was introduced a few years ago, and it's a nice exactly solvable model for a lot of properties like entanglement growth, uh, OTOX, uh, etc. Um, however, it's it's been rather fine-tuned. Um, but more recently, uh, uh, a generalization of this, called generalized dual unitary, um, was introduced where the spatial dynamics is unitary only within a subspace. And that brings me to the, the second class that I want to talk about, which is when there is some permanently stable plateau. So by that, I mean, we, we start from this fully mixed infinite temperature state. And then um, if we go to wait times, or usually actually only like, you usually only have to go to order one time, but uh, there, then you reach a steady state that has an extensive entropy. Um, actually, the state itself doesn't have to be uh, a steady state, but it just has to have the spectrum is preserved um, in varying the time. Then oftentimes, when the spectrum is preserved, it's also the case that the dynamics within this subspace uh, is is a uh, unitarity and it has this sort of like emergent locality. Um, so it has its own light cone with, oh, sorry. What subspace? Uh, so the subspace, which is, um, okay, let me say this in, in general. I mean, like you start fully mixed and then you evolve to some steady state and that state like defines us, it's a, it's a mixed state and it defines a subspace within the full Hilbert space. Um, so if you start with a fully mixed state and you evolve over the unitary, doesn't that solve this for me? Yeah, that's, yes, precisely. And that's why you would just get E of V equals V. But what I'm saying now is that we're, we want to know the dynamics across an arbitrary orientation of the membrane. And if it's, if it, first of all, the circuit might not be unitary in any direction. But even if it's unitary in the time direction, it might not be unitary in some other direction uh, that's outside the light cone, right? I mean, unless it's dual unitary, which is the special case I just described. But more generally, if, if you're running a, this circuit, and now if, if I wanted to take this circuit, I want to run perpendicular to this to this membrane, say. Uh, so I'm going through these gates in like the wrong direction. So they won't generally be unitary. And so it's a special case when even if it's not fully unitary, um, it might be it, it evolves to some some uh, to some mixed state. Um, and if you took any like pure state within that mixed state ensemble, uh, that you would get unitary dynamics within that ensemble. Um, and in such cases, uh, then if you have this, if you still have this this light cone structure, uh, then basically. Now, as long as your membrane is pointing outside that light cone, then you will have uh, you can be, you'll still get E of V being proportional to V. It just won't be with the same proportionality. Um, and we call these we call these uh, models fully multi-unitary if basically all of the membrane orientations lie within one of these these light sectors. Um, this this includes anything of the form blank unitary that appears in the literature, basically. Um, yeah, and so maybe a more, a fit more uh, picturesque, that's not the right word, a more uh, pictorial way of, 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 of describing this is basically, uh, so in this case, I'm showing this membrane in black that's, that's rotating. I've superimposed it on a honeycomb lattice to show the example of when things are, have three. Uh, so this is a tri-unitary case. 
And so the, the case here is like, if you ran it in one of these three directions at the center of these circle uh, sectors, then it would be a unitary uh, circuit. And so in that case, basically each of these three time directions um, has its own sector associated to it within which um, you can just use unitarity with respect to that direction to evaluate the line tension. And as a result, you can basically just think of the, the entropy with, as long as the normal vector, which is shown in black, uh, points within a given light sector, it's it's as if all the entropy is just flowing within that associated time direction. And so in that case, the the surface or the line tension, uh, which I called E tilde before, is that's why it's just given by this inner product. So it's like all the entropy is just flowing along this chosen direction, and it changes discontinuously as you hop from one uh, sector to the other. Well, sorry, I should say the slope is discontinuous. The tension itself is continuous. Um, so I don't know how much time I have. Um, about five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as expected, I will just uh maybe give you like two examples in in uh two D. Um, and then I'll finish. So uh yeah. So I want to show you some examples in in higher dimensions besides uh, just the one plus one D example I showed and. I don't really want to get into this just to say that the circuits that we consider are like these 3D tensor networks, which are just composed of these projectors. Um, and what we find is that basically what you can do is, uh, yeah, so if you consider uh, the, the case where the projectors are just on the, the vertices of a simple cubic lattice, then you get um, these sectors. You have three unitary time directions, and you get these sectors that form the face, they're, they're square pyramids that form the faces of this cube. And so you get this very simple form of the, the membrane tension, where it's just as if it's all flowing with along either X, Y, or Z. Uh, there's another case where if you put it, put these projectors at the center of, or sorry, at the vertices of a BCC lattice, then you don't have any direction that's fully unitary. Um, basically, your projectors have like too many legs, so they're going to project stuff out. Um, but there's these directions which are at the center of these tetrahedra, which have the maximal plateau entropy density. Um, and those define their own light sectors, which form these this light octahedron. Um, and yeah, so those are just like two quick examples. Uh, maybe I can just say a few words about the, the case where we have say randomness. So right. So in a in a Clifford circuit, basically one can show that as long as it doesn't purify completely, uh, then it will reach some plateau steady state that just stays there forever if it's space-time translation invariant. But if you take away the space-time translation invariance and say have like, say you're in the mixed phase of a random hybrid Clifford circuit, then basically what happens is in the mixed phase, the entropy density will be some finite value. For like an exponentially long time. And because it has a flat spectrum, uh, you can just consider the, the Hartley entropy or the, the rank entropy. And that decreases like very like exponentially rarely because it takes integer values. And so only when you have a purification event uh, does the membrane like find a new minimum energy. And in between that, it's still zero temperature. It's just it's a zero temperature DPRE. Um, so there's no thermal fluctuations. However, there's fluctuations due to the, the randomness. So uh, you can't really see it, especially since um, this DPRE fixed point is at T equals zero. Uh, so temperature is actually irrelevant. So even in the generic case where you don't have T equals zero, um, it's still described by the same fixed point. So with that, I will summarize by just saying, so I try to, describe for you what the, the situation is when you have some individual realization of the system, uh, such as a quantum circuit, uh, and how you can interpret the, the entanglement membranes associated with the, the entropy production in terms of like a flow of dynamics across a membrane, and how when that dynamics has unitarity or unitarity within some subspace, then uh, you can sort of understand the flow as just being along one of these discrete directions. Um, and 
uh, yeah, with that, I will conclude and just show some some future directions. And yeah, I don't want to keep you from your uh, vittles, I guess. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, well, so if the if if you feed in a fully mixed state and in that, in that case then the entropy density of the the plateau state is just the line tension uh because the line tension like per unit length um it yeah it's like the if it, if the if the if the membrane is going fully uh horizontal then the tension per unit length is just the same as the entropy density uh right it's the entropy per unit length but then I'm also confused because if the unit fairly transform up going in state, then don't you always get the proportional side? Well, yes, that's why that's why in the case where um yes, but, but but the point is that it's not usually unitary. If it is unitary, then then this yeah, if it is unitary, then this this particular orientation will have um an entropy density of one, but perhaps the the uh, the thing maybe you're confused about is where I said it was equal to v. Yeah. The reason why is because this is per time. Uh. So if yeah. So it's 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 proportional to v equals infinity for the yeah. If you if you if you make it per like length, then you'll get one. That's why I like writing it this way because then it's like you would just get one. Well, I mean, I guess what I mean is it's the entropy density. Yeah, sorry. What I meant is the tension per unit length is the entropy density. But if you want to normalize it by time, you would just have to divide. You just have to multiply by whatever, like by V. Um, yeah, or square root of one plus V squared in the general case. Right. One more I think I saw this hand first. Yeah. So, like, well, no, uh, so yeah, I should have been more clear. Um, in general, if you run a unitary circuit at some like or, or not unitary, these are gates, but they don't have to be unitary. I mean, in this picture, they were because I said case one unitary. Um, but in general, like these could be so. Yeah, the general setting we're considering is a combination of unitaries and like forced measurements. Um, however, uh, and, and that can just be interpreted as you just take this tensor network and run it at any angle. Um, and then like, say, if you run a unitary gate sideways, then it, you can basically by polar decomposition, it'll just be a unitary times a force projector. For the monitored cases, you're not doing a force measurement. You're doing, uh, you know, you're applying Born's rule. However, for the case of a Clifford circuit, the measurement outcome doesn't actually matter in the in the sense of uh, you could just post you you could just apply a like a pal a, a pally to flip it at, afterwards. So it it doesn't affect what the entropy is. Uh, so you could imagine that it's forced. Um, but yeah, the, I guess that's the relation is that uh, I would consider uh, the monitored circuits to be like a special case of this general evolution where you is generally non-unitary. Yeah. Yes, I mean, like the way I, precisely, because even if you even if you claimed that this box was unitary and, and, and obeyed this first condition, uh, then generally when you run it sideways, it will be a projector. Like say it was identity, it will just be like projector onto Bell state, but that would be a really dumb <laughs> circuit. Uh, hmm? Yeah. So so yeah. So the the right there's a distinction be between uh, like a forced measurement and just like a measurement where you and so ba mostly we're considering the case where there are like forced measurements because that's like what you would interpret that that's what you would get if you like consider a unitary or something run at an angle, but you can 
I mean, you still have entanglement membranes in when there's like true measurements. And that's like one of the cases that's this non-zero terminology is forced as measurements and post selection. This this force that yeah, yeah. Um yeah. So yeah, but like for instance, in like a har random monitored circuits, there I guess you wouldn't actually be doing a force measurement, but you can you still have a entanglement membrane, but it, it will be at non-zero temperature because even though you have an exponentially long uh time that you're not purifying, your density matrix eigenvalues are all um, evolving continuously because the rank is staying constant, but the other ones are changing. All right, let's hang Grace again. All right. I'm going to pause the recording, but uh, one thing that I noticed is that um, the
Okay, all the following speakers should unmute the. <laughs> so I need to do something right away. No, no, we did it for you, but the next speaker. Yeah, yeah, the idea is. To... Oh, sorry, in case they're newcomers. Um, what we've been doing so far is uh, get on Zoom ahead of your slot and stay on Zoom. You don't hook up with the uh, uh, wires. Yeah. We'll try. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. It doesn't matter if some Zoom people don't listen to some talks. Okay, so uh, welcome to the afternoon session. So next speaker is Ivan McLeod. And he's going to talk about anomalous fluctuations from prediction. Thank you very much. Thanks, organizers. Um, so I saw in the in the subtitle of the workshop um, four topics, which is uh, integrability, chaos, uh, turbulence, and GHD. And I, while I won't say anything interesting about the last two, I hope I can say something interesting about the first two. And this is working in collaboration with uh, Sarang and Roman. I think we'll both be here tomorrow, or at least later in the conference. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about transport um, statistics in, in systems where there is um, coexistence of ballistic and diffusive modes. And uh, I also want to acknowledge some other collaborators who've been thinking uh, a lot about transport statistics. Um, so Emmanuel, Monica, and Kofo. Okay, why why statistics? Why go beyond linear response? So linear response, just a very quick summary, cares about these, these sort of equilibrium water correlation functions. Um, but, but this is a very sort of narrow view of the world. And there's a lot of information beyond this, so in the noise. Uh, for instance, with shot noise, you can determine the charge of charge carriers. And um, linear response can, can sort of disguise interesting physics. So a, a, a auto correlation function might appear very conventional, just like a, a diffusive correlations, uh, when in fact, actually the fluctuations are very unconventional. For example, uh, charge transport in the half field, um, easy access, axis XXZ model. Um, another reason to care about beyond linear response physics is that many experiments, such as cold atom platform, uh, platforms, um, like to initialize their, their states far from equilibrium. So like number sharp states. So how do we go beyond um, linear response? One way is with full counting statistics. And this essentially just characterizes full distributions. For example, of, of charge transfer, this goes back to the 90s further. Um, and it's also a very natural thing to look at in, in sort of modern experiments like um, quantum gas microscopy experiments where one does single site resolution um, imaging of of the occupancy of each uh, site in an optical lattice. Um, and, and one also has like the notion of snapshots in superconducting qubits as well. And so what does that experimental protocol look like? It's really simple. Um, you just measure at time zero if you've got particle sharp state, um, product state um, in, your, in your number basis, then you don't need to measure it. You just, you know your initial um, charge distribute, or you know where your charge is initially. You then evolve, measure um, the charge of some subsystem, for instance, and repeat. And you build up a distribution for the charge transfer as an example. So what are our sort of expectations? Um, for instance, in, in, in standard diffusive systems, uh, fluctuations really should be described by some hydrodynamic theory. So I've just thrown up uh, a very general nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics for, for a diffusive system. Um, and see, so here's an exclusion process up there, a classic example. Um, and in some cases, we can work with this equation directly. Um, so in 1D um, and with constant uh, diffusivity, so no dependence on the density, the charge transfer um, generating function uh, can actually be computed um, exactly in the, in the long time limit, it's asymptotically exact. Uh, and this is within a framework known as um, macroscopic fluctuation theory. And this agrees with uh, exact calculations where you can do them from the microscopics. So for this example, I've, I've thrown up at the top, which is an exclusion process, uh, the, the results coincide. And, and this scaling um, here, the, the square root T, 
uh, factorizing out at, at late times is uh, like generic with some stipulations on, on these sort of phenomenological transport coefficients being well behaved. Um, and this extends beyond the classical case. So in chaotic quantum systems, um, this, is, this is generally expected to be the whole true as well. And so for, for quantum circuits, which is this first reference, um, we sort of have a, have a pretty reasonable uh, statmic model argument for, for why, that, why this emerges in that case. Okay, so some questions like, is this universal? What else is there? For, for a diffusive transport, can you, can you do more than just this equation? And one area to look at is obviously the stipulations we made. What if they're not correct? What if the transport coefficients are singular? Are there other dynamical universalities with diffusive transport? Um, and what, what minimal ingredients do we, do we need really to break this? What, so are you going to define what is Q of T? Uh, oh, Q, sorry, Q of T is just the charge transfer from one sub, one, the left hand side of my system to the right hand side over some time T. Um, we can have it be connected and then do a measurement at time zero that projects it into some sharp state if it's a, if it's a quantum system. Sorry, since you're already interrupted, what is the, I zoned out. What, what's the little L? That's some like coarse graining length. And sigma is? Uh, like uh, connect, it, it's, it's susceptibility times diffusivity. Yeah. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to talk about when that previous picture breaks. And so one um, obvious example, it's massively overkill, is to, is to look at diffusion in integrable systems. Um, then I'm going to uh, look at a simple toy model that does the same with far less. Um, so that's going to be generalized in this integral case. Um, it's going to be a sort of toy model for uh, transport in, in chaotic systems where there are neutral ballistic modes and a, and a diffusive charge mode. And then finally, I'll, I'll sort of flash some numerical results um, to, in support of that, this toy model. Okay, so in integral systems, if we take non-interacting integral systems, uh, this is not going to have any diffusive transport at all. All my um, labels, charge, flavor, they're just stuck to my quasar particles, they get just get pulled along with them. And so all transport is just ballistic. Um, in interacting integral systems, it's far more diverse. Um, uh, and in, in the case of, for instance, hard rod gases, uh, the XXC model, it's classical solar automata, um, at, if you fine tune the filling to, to half filling, um, charge is uh, diffusive instead of ballistic. And moreover, um, the, the diffusion constant um, is in some sense uh, singular. So uh, away from half filling, it's going to be in some sense infinite because it's not your transport is not ballistic, so not diffusive, it's ballistic. Okay, so here's a really simple example. Um, two component hard rock gases. So I have particles of two labels, plus or minus one is the charge they carry. Let's do elastic scattering. And just so I can draw some really simple diagrams, I've just assumed uh, point-like impenetrable particles rather than my particles having some width. Um, right, so, so in a collision, all that happens is the velocities get exchanged. So to sort of illustrate this filling-dependent transport, um, take some state with some macroscopic current, um, and, and let's have uh, a surplus of charge. So I've got more red coloring here. In this case, the part, the, the, the charge transfer, transfer across um, some point x equals zero is just going to um, grow linearly. So it's going to be ballistically transported. But in a neutral gas, um, while there's a, a net flow of, of total number of particles, uh, the charge that each of these particles carry is going to be random. And um, the, the charge transport is just going to grow diffusively. Um, right. And so this is classical. Yeah. And so in some sense, you, you, you could say that the transport coefficients uh, and certainly the exponents are more acid in the filling. What about statistics? Um, for a 
domain wall initial, which is just labeling um, all my particles as plus charge on the left of the system, negative on the right, hand, right of the system. This has, uh, it's very obvious to see that this is gonna have some um, anomalous full counting statistics. Um, I'm gonna take the velocity distribution to be thermal. So the charge transfer in this case um, is just given by the absolute value of the net uh, flow of particles. And this is a, a very skewed distribution. It's a half Gaussian um, because, because the number of particles that have uh, crossed the center line is Gaussian distributed, but the mod means it's like a, a random walk on, on the half line. And what do I mean by anomalous? I just mean that my cumulants don't all scale with the same power of T. They scale with powers of a, that, that in the exponent we have the, the, the order of the cumulant. Okay, what about equilibrium? So um, in this case, I won't go through the, the steps to, 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 to extract this distribution, but um, take my word for it, there's a cusp. It's again, got anomalous scaling of the cumulant, uh, and this same distribution has been uh, derived in, in various integrable systems, such as easy access, axis XXZ, and, uh, and integral cellular automata. And uh, different power here, it's, it's divided by four rather than divided by two, but um, same anomalous scaling. And yeah, just to contrast with generic diffusive systems, uh, we expect in, in that case, cumulants to uh, satisfy large deviation principle. So all, all growing with the same power of time. Okay, what were the crucial ingredients there? Just from, from hard rods and also from those other integrable systems I, I, I flashed, um, some common themes are neutral ballistic modes, uh, and this imparts ballistic correlations in the kicks that charge feels as they get jostled around, and also a particle hole symmetry. That appeared important. Integrability? No, um, as I'm going to show, actually those previous two ingredients are enough. And so the next part of my talk, I'm going to look at some chaotic systems um, that, that have these two ingredients. And so they will be um, relativistic systems, um, such as Dirac semi-metals, um, where, where we have a, a, a ballistic mode, or a very obvious ballistic mode, energy, uh, and Galilean fluids. So that will be a uh, particle uh, density, particle momentum. And uh, uh, so if graphene is an example of the Dirac semi-metal, multi-component hard spheres will be an example of like, a Galilean fluid. And the multi-component part is important uh, just to have it define a charge. Got two colored species. Uh, in the initial. Yeah. Okay, so uh, graphene, I don't want to uh, spend too much time. Lots of people here know very a lot more than me about graphene. But um, the, the important point here is that um, there, are, there are ballistic modes, so um, it, it, at half filling, this is just given by a, an energy current, uh, a conservation of energy current that's coming from um, sort of this relativistic invariance. Uh, and also importantly, this particle hole symmetry, which lets us uh, have a diffusive transport. Um, and so the hydrodynamic theory for this is uh, the direct fluid, and uh, Andy has a nice review um, on this. Um, Okay, so three conserved quantities here, uh, or multiple components in the current, but there's an energy density, an energy current, and a charge density. And um, the first two are just coming from conservation of the stress energy tensor and Lorentz invariance. And um, just to simplify things, I'm just gonna talk about oil scale hydrodynamics at the moment. Um, and so writing my continuity equation for my energy density, uh, and also for my energy current, um, I need a constitutive relation for my uh, current of energy current. This has to be a rank two tensor. It has to be, as it's a current of a current, it has to transform evenly under time reversal and spatial inversion. And um, this is quite restrictive, but the, the, sort of the, the, the linear Euler scale term we can write down there is um, proportional to the energy, energy density and the isotropic tensor itself. Um, there, there are higher order um, non-linear terms, and this is important when trying to decide precisely what the broadening of these sort of sound, subsequent sound modes will be, and uh, Popkoff 
and others have sort of uh, explained this in detail. But for D dimensions, put these two um, equations together, we'll find two style modes and, uh, and D minus one shear modes. Um, I'm going to restrict uh, to quasi one D geometries, and in the next slide, I'll, I'll explain why it's important, or at least why it's important to get a, a non trivial result for the statistics. Um, but just pressing on with 1D for now, all our shear modes will, will vanish. We'll just get left with two sound modes um, and ignoring broadening. These are just uh, left and right waves, moving waves. Uh, and what do we have for our sound, our, our charge mode? Um, con the, the continuity equation, and we need a constitutive relation. Um, and at the Euler scale, um, the only uh, term we can write down, um, but there's no linear terms. Uh, this this needs to transform oddly under charge inversion and mm -hmm. odd under spatial uh, and and time reversal, um, and so the the only time we can write down up to quadratic order is this nonlinear coupling between the charge density and the energy current. Third order terms going to give log corrections. Um, okay, so before we do this, I I really feel like I ought to explain why I've chosen uh, to to restrict one D quasi one D geometries. So if I have higher D, uh, I, I talk about charge transfer, I need to do a bipartition of my system. And in, in 1D, that's just a point, a point dividing my line in two halves. For higher D, it's a macroscopically large like, interface. And so charge can, can cross at any point in the interface and end up summing over many, many um, contributions. And this just gives central limit um, scaling all, all my Cumulants are just going to be totally dominated by uh, by sort of so the central limit uh, scaling. So nothing interesting will happen. Um, whereas if I restrict to sort of quasi one D geometries, where my linear length is very long and my my width is large enough that I can still use the, the graphene bulk dispersion, I want to 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 be able to just lift this uh, this this Dirac fluid hydrodynamics, um, but but short enough that um, I, I'm not getting dominated by central limit scaling. So, sorry, in, so in 2D, you'll never see these? Uh, uh, yeah, true, like truly, yeah. Uh, if the, the, you'll get like a one over square root width yeah. suppression in like the, in, the interesting thing you might want to see. And as you take that to be large, then, yeah. Can you see something interesting in the, the statistics of a finite region? Um, what, what do you mean in, in high dimensions or? Yeah, so, so in D equals two, your problem is that, you know, you, you, take, you take a wider and wider system, the, you have you have more ways that add up, right? Yeah. But if I take it, if I take a disk of a fixed size, right, then it's got a fixed perimeter. And so I have a finite number. Well, of... it, 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 if you have a finite system size, you're going to reach saturation before. So the, 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 the this anomalous scaling is a long time limit. And so if you've got a finite system, okay. the, the fluctuations don't grow of number or of the fluctuations of charge uh, transferred in and out of the system doesn't have that like growth phase forever, it saturates and you don't end up seeing this like anomalous scaling. So you, you need sort of an infinite system, subsystem um, in order to have like, be able to take an infinite time limit. And that then that then screws you if you're, if you're in higher D. I mean, I'm not saying there's nothing interesting in high ID, but from the perspective like of charge transfer statistics, there isn't something interesting. Okay, so back to this toy model, I've got some hydrodynamic equation for my charge. Um, I've got this Euler scale term, which is nonlinear nonlinear coupling in the charge and these sound waves. And, and I have some, now I've introduced some like dissipative terms and like ordinary diffusion fixed law term. Um, or at least th this this is there generally, um, and my my sound waves as the sound waves they're ballistically correlated. I'm going to assume thermal fluctuations in my initial state, and this is just given here by this uh, this delta correlator. Okay, so just in the interest of <coughs> doing something quickly, I'm going to drop this guy and just look at a a model where I have a multiplicative noise. Essentially, this plus Neglecting fixed law, I just have a, a simple theory with a, with a multiplicative um, noise driving um, the, the, the current in my of my charge, and it, it, here's sort of a schematic of this. 
the, the velocity, the, the field five, the energy current, um, is imparting um, random velocity kicks on each of my charge carriers, but they've got these ballistic correlations. So I won't go through the details here, but um, one can sort of solve this um, self consistently, uh, and we find the following sort of solution. Um, and what's the consequence of this? So charge transfer is in fact given by a single random walker, xt, and uh, multiplied by the charge density in the strip zero to x. And so I can, m here is uh, the, the, the charge density in my initial. So I can prepare that as a domain wall um, initial state, and lo and behold, we get uh, this half Gaussian, which is we, we'd seen had, had, had appeared it for hard rods. Um, it also appears in, in the, the cellular automata, the integral cellular automata, and um, easy access XXZ. And likewise, the, the equilibrium also uh, reproduces the same distribu this cusp distribution. I so, mean, why, why is it only part of it? Oh, no, I mean, it's just zero here. No, I, yeah, but I guess for the Dirac fluid, I'm just confused why you can't have negative charge. I've, I've prepared positive charge on the left, negative charge on the right, and I've asked how much charge has moved from left to right. So if you get any net flow of particles the opposite direction, they're bringing the negative charge. But okay, I guess, isn't that like a, that seems very, very far from a regime where you could sort of tailor expand the constituent relation. Yeah, fair enough. I, I don't have a uh, I, I don't have a good response right now. I think we should talk about that. But but at least in the equilibrium case, I think it's reasonable. Um, okay. So what happens if we restore that fixed law diffusion term? Um, you you can do some analytic things here, but for, for the sake of not making my talk too long, um, I'm. I'm going to say we can just numerically solve this. So what happens when we uh, do the domain initial or the equilibrium initial um, after including the fixed law? Um, we just uh, we, we have different limit shapes for these distributions. They're still non-Gaussian. Um, the cumulate still scale anomalously. Um, yeah, and this, in, in the domain case, it's still it's highly skewed. How do you get from the equation to the polyphonic? So this this equation this uh, uh so th there's there's a solution to um, still consistent solution to the 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 uh, uh, the hydrodynamic the multiplicative noise hydrodynamic equation um, and then uh, full counting the the the, the delta q um, is just some integral over the current across the zero across x equals zero. Mm -hmm. But then you want all the cumulus. Yeah, I know, but th th this here is. Um, it, it, there, there's randomness in the walk, so the statistics come from there, and there's also randomness for equilibrium. There's randomness in my um, my charge configuration, which is M. So both these things are randomly distributed, and so we, we end up with distributions. The charge transfer is is, is given by some distribution, which like in, involves a, a dis involves uh, the, the the statistics of M and of X. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the, oh, the, the, yeah, no, the, 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 the cumulant generating function is essentially just a Fourier transform of these distributions, so they contain all the same information. Okay, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so for the third part of my talk, uh, I'm going to be a bit of a rehash, but for Galilean fluids, um, in particular, two component hard spheres. That would be the, the, the simulation that I'll show some um, numerics for. So with Galilean invariants, um, rather than having uh, a Lorentz invariance implying conservation of, of an energy current, we have uh, conservation of momentum, which is going to be our particle current. And so we get sound modes again. Um, but um, the difference between the Dirac fluid and, and these Galilean fluid fluids is that uh, particle density and current 
ha have swapped roles with energy density and energy current. Um, th there's also so some complication about there also being a heat mode. Uh, there's like a, a, an extra conservation law. Energy is conserved um, in the Galilean fluid, whereas uh, particle number total particle, total particle number in the Dirac fluid is not conserved. Um, but but the heat mode is not dangerous. This story the, the story is still uh, force it. You can still force this sort of this, this toy model through. So our, our, we need a, a, a constitutive relation for our charge. Um, again, this is just the, the only Euler scale term we can write to, to quadratic order is the charge coupling this time to the particle current. And so we expect, um, in, just like in this, this direct fluid picture, um, we expect there to be some anomalous uh, charge uh, transfer statistics in, in, in the uh, hard spheres. And so um, I, I simulated um, a sort of quasi 1D um, geometry with, with hard disks. Um, I haven't put it here, but the density is about half. The packing, the filling um, is about a half. And uh, yeah, but very long system, width much shorter, 10, 10 disk widths. Um, so yes, two, 2D. And what one finds is um, reasonably good agreement with that theory. There, there's clearly some anomalous scaling. These are not the same powers. Um, and it's pretty much double the power as you go from the second to the fourth cumulant in equilibrium. And in domain wall uh, initial, we, we find um, correspondingly this anomalous scaling, um, it, not exactly a half. I, I think there's actually some long time tails which um, need to push to later times. But so this is quite preliminary, but we think the, the, the previous toy model is very speculative, but I think, I think numerics um, is, is helping us believe that this anomalous statistics is, is real. Okay, so to summarize, charge transport in fluids with a particle hole symmetry and uh, neutral ballistic modes, um, are such as like these direct semimetals or like multi-component classical plasmas, um, they are unconventional. Um, the statistics are unconventional in, in, in 1D. Um, and this is because of a, a ballistically correlated uh, multiplicative noise that's in, imparting the kicks to, to like parcels of charge. Um, and this is generalizing results in integral systems, those, those cusp distributions people have found um, in, in integral systems up to, up to this point. Um, but really, it, integrability is, is, is massively overkill. This mechanism is, is just a, a, about a, a nonlinearity in, in a constitutive relation. Um, Yes, so so as I just mentioned, uh, it's quite the, co the consequence is quite dramatic in quasi one D geometries. Um, we have some numerical evidence, um, and um, we we heard about uh, the the uh, Wiedemann Franz law violation of Wiedemann Franz law um, before lunch, um, and that is one of these diagnostics of uh, hydrodynamic behavior of electrons, but. We are going to propose charge full counting statistics um, in, in, let's say, um, nano uh, carbon graphene nanotubes um, as another signature that doesn't require like heat transport or thermoelectric measurements. And finally, um, while I talked about 1D um, and statistics in 1D, we think that the that, that higher point correlation functions, such as like charge squared, charge squared um, correlators, will be sensitive to this nonlinearity as well as, as um, M, M squared can overlap with the, uh, with the current while M can't. Yeah, okay, so uh, with that, I'm gonna end my talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so in the example of the hard spheres, um, like it seems like they're identical except for the fact that you say it's not already in the world. Yeah. What happens if you, you know, like give them the diameter or something like that. Well, if I give them, if, if I give them some some symmetric interaction, so reds have some interaction with reds and blues have the same interaction with blues. Um, if if yeah, if I have some interaction which depends on the charge of the two particles colliding, then I don't think the story changes. But if you if you, for instance, make one of these discs larger than the other and color all of those ones blue. Then I think you you'll get some. I, I don't actually know what happens there. 
because you don't have a particle hole symmetry in that case. You need to have a particle hole symmetry uh, to really protect this diffusive transport. Otherwise, I'm sure you're going to get um, charge current overlapping with, uh, it, it can mix with the uh, particle current. So you definitely need a, a particle hole symmetry. Yeah. So do you have a single calculus that you use in the calculus numerically? versus Oh, you, you mean when solving a PDE? Yeah. No, that's that's really uh, just dis discretizing having particles that move under, that, that non-interacting particles that just move under some holistically correlated noise. So, so you really are unable to put, you know, to choose a different calculus? Or I mean, we, we, we could, we just haven't tried. Because you, you do get different answers from the theory that comes up. Right, so so I I don't have a uh, diffusion constant depending on n here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that would I don't know. I I don't think that changes the story. I mean this this sort of convective term is like wow. the Euler scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'll leave this to I'll leave this to future. Yeah, maybe maybe there's something there. Yeah. But the simulations you've done are all you know. Yeah. Well, see that, that that's the Wall Street version of things. Okay. <laughs> One good example. <clears throat> yeah, it's encouraged to have the low vacuum condition between the particles that when the binary. Um. So, so the the um. When the first example was one the liquid. Your heart. I mean, hard rods. oh, hard rods, right? So, yeah, yeah. The, no, that's th those are just impenetrable, impenetrable point particles. So, charge conflict is if you have two immutable liquids and potentially the period of the motion of the ball. Yeah, I think you can, yes. Yeah. I just want to add something to you. Are you saying that uh, there is no large relation principle for this uh, charge transfer? Yeah, it's not it the 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 transport the, the mechanism behind the diffusion of the charge is not independent motion of the charges. They're all feeling the same in one D. They're all feeling the same correlated kicks as these waves pass through every pass of charge. Yeah. So this okay, so this makes it so an integrable system when you add the noise with uh, the certain thermodynamics. The noise has to be created in space. Yes. So you see this change with the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's thank you. Ooh. You know where the zone is? No. So it's in the web page. Strange. Oh. So we go to this ITS web page. So Tobias is uh, connecting. I want to encourage people to eat another lunch during the next half <laughs> break. Let me see the point of saving them. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll for the grades, it's well. <laughs> All right. So connect with audio. Yeah. <clears throat> no, no, no. I think you're getting picked up. So I just might. Yeah. yeah so we. So have, no uh, disconnect from your audio, audio but with yeah, okay. just get. Share this thing. Yeah, yeah, don't join. 
just put this little yeah. And yes, then I yeah, I might want to show. It's not. All right, full screen, everything. Uh, yeah, why not? And, uh, not yet. Full screen. Sure. No, 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 it's fine. It's, it's your... it's full Bear with me for a second. There's a no reason for mm -hmm. this you multitude. No, I think this is this is good for now. So, okay. because I later I have also a little Mac here. So okay. Uh, oh, just tell you, tell you everything. But audio, everything is okay. Yes. Yeah, everything is okay. All right. Thank so, you. well, thank you so much uh, for inviting okay. me. Thank you so much for the um to the organizers. So. Um, the story I'm going to tell is sort of a longer story spanning more than 10 years of research. And um, before I get into the details, I want to quickly introduce my collaborators. Um, everything sort of started around 2010, 2011, when I was on my first sabbatical back in Germany and reconnected with Rainer Rauer. Um, and um, one of the things they are that I was working in solitons and nonlinear optics and other things before was that uh, we sort of wanted to give again turbulence a fresh look and from the perspective of structures. So the whole idea here is still turbulence is not solved, but to somehow have a different perspective on maybe developing a systematic approach in understanding turbulent features. And one of the ideas was that, you know, it's fairly hard if you just write down some Navier-Stokes equations to go from the equations to some statistical laws. And um, was that numerically you observe that in a lot of these turbulent systems, you have structures. And these structures very often are thought to dominate the tails of the underlying probability distribution. So the question was, can we actually from the equation, get those structures. And maybe that opens a new way in understanding turbulent features. And that's in some way the, the idea. And uh, now sort of bear with me. Some of you might already, if you know how these instantions are computed in the context of, um, for instance, Burgess equation, then uh, you know you know a lot of these things, uh, but at the very end, I'll sort of represent, uh, I'll present a couple of really new and novel results. Um, before I go into this, why are we doing this? This is not only to get another idea about maybe one of the last classical problems standing, but in general, the tools and the approaches that we are developing can help in any kind of context where people are interested in rare events, in sort of the underlying assumption that the probability distributions that you're looking at are non gauche And um, there are like many examples. I just put a couple of important examples on there. And most um, striking is, and again, this community, you know this, um, if you take a Gaussian distribution and have a Gauss in comparison to a con um, distribution with fat tails, here I just chose just for example, like an alpha stable distribution, then uh, why, well, if you just look at the distribution, you might think, oh, they look very similar. If you assume Gaussianity in the tails, your idea about the likelihood of rare events might not be off by a factor of two or three, you know, if I underestimate the likelihood by a factor of 10,000 or something like this. So it's really important to develop all kinds of methods to figure out um, how to get a handle on these rare events. Um, with this, um, I'll just change to the focus, the first part of the focus of my talk, that's the stochastically driven Burgess equations. So this is now our system for rare events that we want to look at. And um, 
It's it's a toy model. This is not supposed to represent real non-Stokes turbulence, but as Uriel Prush has once put it, um, Locus equation is a wonderful destructive tool. So <laughs> if, if you have an idea about turbulence and it doesn't work for both of us, most likely it will not work for other things as well. So this is why maybe trying out these things in Burgos, and you will see that even this, at the end of the day, turns out to be maybe much more complicated than some things, um, is a good start. Uh, the setup is actually sort of very similar. I've seen stochastic differential equations, uh, even also in the talk before. Here, um, what I want to point out is that we, we drive sort of with a correlation function that's delta in T, but it's sort of has large correlations in space. And this is sort of consistent with the typical. Yeah. Before progress, Cornelius stones are rare than more likely than expected. Hmm? Cornelius stones are rare than more likely than expected. You have tails everywhere. Yeah. So, but uh, like for this system, I can just show you an example. So, Screen. So here's what I'm doing, just to see. I basically take the non uh, Burgos equation. I start with a zero initial condition. I have this driving force, and then I just simulate, 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 and. Uh, See what happens. What happens is as I go along, the system develops sort of trucks. And I'm interested in the distribution of the negative gradient gradients. And the reason why this is interesting is is the deterministic dynamics, you know how it works for Burgos, will once want to make this shock sort of very steep, but then it's the viscosity that prevents, obviously, a collapse. And uh, here's sort of what you see, the distribution of these uh, velocity gradients that is plotted in the lower half is clearly non-Gaussian. Yeah, it's clearly skewed. And um, what this system does is whenever there is a large, well, not, not really large, just for illustration, a uh, negative gradient that is around negative four, then it adds that whole time history to a database. And what you see on top is just the average of those. And uh, in five or six minutes, I will try to convince you that this is actually the instanton that you can see in a very simple, simple setup in this kind of system, and that it has actually a really important meaning in that context. So in this way, the problem in some way is very clear and crisp and formulated from a mathematical perspective. What we want to compute is this probability density. And what we are going to do is we are going to use a somewhat hybrid approach. Um, in general, if you have stochastic differential equations, um, there are quite a few things that you can do, but um, Solving them entirely analytically is uh, most of the time not possible. And if you just think of Monte Carlo simulations, then uh, if you are going for the rare events, it's much better if you do something smart like important sampling. Um, and that's also something that these instant ones I'm going to talk about can be very useful. So when you deal with those SDEs, in principle, there is a choice of three approaches. You can just look at the SDE directly. Uh, very popular on Wall Street. <laughs> it all started <laughs> with TDEs, but then it, it changed a little bit. You can look at the Poca-Planck equations, obviously. 
Or what you can do is you can write down a path integral representation. So in, in quick terms, you solve for the Brownian increment, you pop it into your joint probability density and pops out the path integral that has been so successful in um, condensed matter and so many quantum electrodynamics and so many um, frameworks. And the question is, it, can that path integral also be successful here in order to figure out the structure of those rare elements? Why do we like path integrals? Well, what we like is that um, the probability density has this e to the negative s um, action functional or large deviation, you call this the friedman benzel functional. And obviously, this probability density will peak at the minimizer of that functional. So you have a stochastic problem that you now um, essentially convert it into a functional minimization problem. We know how to do this. You can just think of this as the Lagrangian, and you can write down the Euler-Lagrange equations and approximate your probability density. And um, so in principle, this is not hard, and it's well known. Just um, it's just not so difficult, not so easy to solve for that minimizer, simply because of the number of degrees of freedom. Yeah. So, so in the simulation here, maybe you have a time discretization of five thousand parents. You have two thousand forty-eight, like two to the eleventh spatial, spatially, and so F min in MATLAB will not do the job. You need to find some some good way of of doing this. Um, how can you do this in general? Well, um, you can. There's a choice between the Lagrangian picture and the Hamiltonian picture, and uh, for a very simple system that we all know, the einstein uhlenbeck process, you can easily compute that minimizer. And you all might recall the minimizer for that one is just um, an exponential function. So when we started this research, the first question that we sort of were asked, well, can we see these minimizers actually in numerical simulation? simulation? Can we just see them in our system? And uh, now in a very simple setting, if you just again think of the einstein uhlenbeck process, the question is, well, can you see that exponential function in the einstein uhlenbeck process? So how can we do this? Well, we can just simulate the einstein uhlenbeck process and just look at the time history when you actually get to the slightly rare event and just plot those trajectories. And if you do this, uh, it's not, it will vanish once it appears. This is sort of the basically the just the overlay of all those trajectories. Now, intuitively, it might make a lot of sense. If you just take the average of those, you should expect to end up at your exponential function, and you actually do. And this is exactly what is happening in our MATLAB script here. Above, yeah. So, so basically, what what happens above here is that I sort of filtered, I conditioned on that rare event, and now I just add those all up. I basically I just compute the mean, and I can see that minimizer or that instant time pop up in my direct simulation. Now, how do I compute? these minimizers in an ODE setting? Well, essentially, for the simple uh, case of additive noise, you get these coupled equations in the Hamiltonian picture. Now you can do everything in the PDE world. That is not hard to do. We know how to do this. Just use the martin sitcher rose form formalism, or, I mean, people, again, just use large deviation theory. And if you do this, then in the PDE world, you get a coupled system of PDEs for your minimizer. And these are the instanton equations, and they have just, this, just the PDE equivalent to the simple ODE equivalent. And the meaning of this is the following. 
This P is the optimal noise that when inserted as a driver into the original equation will lead to that rare event. And uh, this obviously gives a second possibility of computing those instantons. What I can do is I can solve this coupled system of PDEs and get my instanton there. And then I can compare the filtered instanton with the numerical instanton. So this kind of you know, augmenting the dynamics to make the rare event not rare. Literally. Yes, exactly. So, 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 so exactly. So the idea is to basically move to a, to a situation where you know exactly what the optimal force field, the optimal stochastic force field is that will end up in that rare event. And that's exactly the, um, the minimizer of the writing action function. Now, for Burgers, there was actually a really interesting story. Um, um, Migdal and Guari a long time ago sort of investigated all this, but they looked at the, the right tail, which is in some way, uh, it's much harder for the system to create positive gradients, obviously. So it's much easier for the large variation to kick in. Um, so this is in some way was um, the, the sort of first approach in this direction, but the left tail is the really interesting tail. And there's a beautiful paper by uh, Barkovsky, Falkovich, uh, and others that actually use the Cole Hopf transform and really smart um, approximation techniques to the Cole Hopf transform system um, in order to get the scaling exponent of that um, of that uh, probability distribution for the negative large gradients. And they ended up with 1.5. And then really nice numerics were done by Goto. And it turned out the scaling that was observed was 1.15, really far away from 1.5. And it seemed at the end of the 90s that this idea using Burgess as a destructive tool seemed to show, well, the instanton form doesn't, doesn't work. And um, still, Falkovich group went a little further and uh, started to compute also the instanton numerically. And what we then did, um, again, years ago with Ryan of us, we sort of started to read all these papers, go through all this, um, re-implement everything. And the first thing that we saw was, here's an example of what the instantons actually look like. This is actually you. You will see that structure looks So you basically already saw this, yeah. This is the this is this is the the time evolution that is in the MATLAB picture upstairs. Yeah. So this is what the instanton looks like, the um for the field U, and again this is the field P. Not a lot uh, versus T going to negative infinity, but as the dynamics develops, you sort of see there's almost uh almost a linear path. That's basically the instanton is trying to avoid the viscous team, um, the viscous term, and then at the end it goes. Well, what we found was that essentially the filtered instanton and the computed instanton were basically identical. And then we said, well, there must be some reason why that the instantons sh still should work. In burgers, and um, just so I understand, the idea is that if the instantons are there in the simulations, why is the exponent wrong? No, nah, it was just a parameter problem. In the in the in the while the paper 
with the three halves is entirely correct. There's no mistake in the paper at all. Again, it's a beautiful paper. That three over two kicks in only much further in the tails. Mm -hmm. If you use the computational instanton for, of burgers and compare that, um, we got 1.16. So actually very, very close. And from there on, um, we decided, okay, it's worth to pursue that direction. The instantons are back in terms of trying to understand um, turbulent behavior. And the next step that we took was to tackle fluctuations. So um, you basically saw the cloud here around the Ornstein uhlenbeck very roughly speaking. You can now think of Yeah, you can th think of that these instantons come with a cloud of Gaussian fluctuations around. And um, for many problems, if you actually want to compute the probability density and not only the scaling, then you need to incorporate these fluctuations because they are going to yield the pre factor. So, how do you do this? This is in principle, in principle, this was also known for a very long time, maybe for a lot hundred years, 60 or 70 years, but we didn't have the computational tools to actually solve these equations. So what you find is that the fluctuations will be presented by our matrix Riccati equation. And of course, now these um, matrices become fields. When you look at, um, at, um, at stochastic PDEs, but this all can be done. Uh, and then in 2021, two papers were published. And you see the, we are, <laughs> the, the groups are very close. Uh, Tobias Grafke is in the intersection <laughs> of those two groups. Um, we developed the right tools to actually figure out how to uh, compute those uh, fluctuations. And also, if you're interested in other systems, um, like transport equations or Markov jump processes. Um, this all can be done. Um, and if you want to talk more about these things, we can talk also about this later. So there's now a whole tool set for quantifying rare events. Um, the most recent results we obtained was to look at a system that was um, published by uh, Judge Wrong and um, so this group was looking from a phenomenological point of view at a um, uh, nonlinear Schrödinger equation in a way that um, you have a quite high nonlinearity. And for those systems, there's a critical norm. If you start high enough, you actually will get a columns. So there's some similarity to Burgers, where obviously you will have uh, infinite gradients if you don't have viscosity, but once you introduce viscosity here and there, you will arrest this collapse. But what you numerically observe is that the structures are much more independent. In Burgos, you have a lot of interaction with the shocks, and that actually causes problems. So this is in some way a much sort of cleaner, structural dominated case of turbulence. And um, so we decided to apply our formalism to the system. And uh, we actually were left with a big surprise. Um, if you only take into account the instant one contribution, it turns out that you don't get the scaling. So what happens is that uh, at some point, and it's exactly at that point where in the deterministic system, you would get a collapse. Uh, this is sort of the scaling that you get only from the instanton, and you actually need to incorporate the fluctuations in this case to even get the scale. And uh, this is our, our latest result. Again, uh, the system that they are looking is very nice because in some way, uh, this is really, you have all these rare events 
but they are not interacting a lot. And you can really show that those um, drive the tails of the probability distribution, but not by themselves. You need to incorporate the fluctuations. And um, yeah, for, <laughs> for all these systems, there are now all these tools. So if you're interested, if you have any kind of rare event or you want to compute those instantons, the tools are there, not only for the instantons with themselves, but also for the fluctuations that, yeah, in some cases are absent. Thank you so much. I guess that the fluctuations should only affect the free factor, not the exponent, provided that it matters so much to the scaling. Yeah, that's that is, that is still an open question. I mean, you were we were, <laughs> we were really, really surprised. So surprised by that. And I, again, um the um the, the somehow um, intuitive uh, intuitive explanation is that they this this curve just starts to deviate exactly where in the deterministic system you would get collapse. So that seems to be that critical point. Well, well, yeah. And if so, you did the nonlinear Turing equation with the opposite sign for interaction. That's on our list. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. So typically when people study chaotic maps, they also have a technique to make the this rare orbits be more typical orbits. Yeah, that's is very it, similar. It's very that's very similar. similar so you can use these kind of uh, instantons obviously to bias your noise if you want right. to do important sampling and then use some like, sort of theorem to compensate for that. So does your work have anything to do with uh, like a uh, with mapping of the population problem, of the Fermion's problem to directed <laughs> to directed percolation? That is somewhat similar, yeah. Okay, so the next speaker is Joshua, and he's going to talk about uh, chaotic measures in high energy. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Josh. Um, the topic for today, I think, was uh, electron hydrodynamics plus some departures. Um, I'm definitely one of those departures. Um, I'm from the fluids turbulence literature, um, kind of you know, subgroup. Um, and yeah, so today we're going to be talking about how to represent chaotic measures uh, efficiently in high dimensions. Uh, Okay, so the outline of this talk is basically going to be as follows. Um, I want to walk through why statistics and measures are a robust way to talk about chaotic systems. Um, then I want to talk about a small subset of chaotic systems known as axiom A chaotic systems, which have a really nice perspective uh, in terms of looking at chaotic measures and in terms of decomposing them in simpler parts. So I want to walk through that perspective. And then finally, I'll walk through how we can generalize this perspective to fluid turbulence. Um, a little caveat, I'll be working essentially entirely in a low dimensional chaotic system today. Um, but like I said, I'm from turbulence and the aim here is to bring this method to a turbulent setting. So I'm gonna draw in connections to turbulence along the way. Um, so I think we can all agree that chaos is a very difficult problem. Um, I have an example, uh, an example of chaos here, the Lorentz 1963 system. Um, I've initialized it in three nearly identical configurations, uh, but as the system evolves in time, those three almost identical configurations become dynamically dissimilar. Um, so this sensitivity to initial conditions is sort of a foundational property of chaos, and it makes forecasting chaotic systems very difficult. Um, and that's a problem for us. Um, I love that the last talk was about extreme events. Um, we need to understand sort of how to mitigate these extreme events 
better. And in order to do that, we have to forecast chaotic systems. When we think about some of the most catastrophic things that can happen in our daily lives, we see events like cardiac events and seizures. Both of these are examples of extreme events in chaotic systems. And so we need to know how to forecast this better. And to do so, we need to overcome this sensitivity to initial conditions. So how can we go about doing that? Um, let's take those three configurations of the Lorentz system that I showed you before. Let's plot them distinctly. And let's also plot a histogram of where each system has been uh, sort of behind each configuration. As time evolves, these three configurations will become dynamically dissimilar. This is our sensitivity to initial conditions. Uh, but if we plot this system for many, 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 many time scales forward in time, we see that each one of these systems visits the same places in the state space and with the same frequency. This is due to a property known as ergodicity, which most chaotic systems either have or in a practical setting uh, can be presumed to have. And this makes a statistical description of chaos very fruitful. So if we consider some observable defined in our state space, and we consider its infinite time average, we can rewrite this average in time as a weighted average of A over our state space in terms of some measure mu. Um, if the system is sufficiently nice, we can even write this. Oh, that kind of sucks. You can't see that. Yeah, you have to do what? Do what? Yeah. Like that. Well, now you can move the drag thing and like drag it. Oh, awesome. Love that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, so if the system is sufficiently nice, we can rewrite this measure actually as a mass density function times uh, the, the Lebesgue measure. This natural density here, rho of x, is what we're approximating here with the histogram in the back. So yeah, effectively, that there is a chaotic attractor, and that any point you initialize on will wander through the entire chaotic set, uh, no matter where you start. So that's the ergodicity. But over what set is this? Is this ergodic? Uh, I mean, it's essentially over a fractal set in the state space. It is the chaotic set. Uh, so if you basically initialize a uniform grid of points, everywhere in the state space and integrate forward in time, that entire state space will limit to this fractal set in the state space. Yeah. That sort of limiting set is what I'm talking about. So it's sort of ergodic post talk on the set of trajectories. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 on the chaotic attractor. Um, okay, so this is a really fruitful description because we've completely sidestepped uh, our dependence on initial conditions. Okay, um, so effectively we've solved our problem. Uh, if you want to see if we've solved turbulence, I guess come to uh, uh, Srinivasan's talk tomorrow. But we've, we've essentially solved our problem, our sensitivity to initial conditions. And we can now do very practical, useful things with these averages. If I want to now mitigate how often people experience seizures, I can consider the time average of some indicator function in the state space, that is one when we're in the region associated with seizures, zero otherwise. I can look at how that average changes as I change hyperparameters of my system. I can then basically design medication that will move opposite to this gradient and find medication that basically mitigates seizures in people. Um, interestingly enough, I have a colleague who was hired by Dyson uh, to do this exact same procedure to minimize the amount of noise uh, given off by a Dyson vacuum. So very practical, very useful uh, process. Okay. Uh, but this is a unnecessarily arduous process to actually do in practice, because to compute these averages efficiently and on the fly, you need access to one of these two objects, either the natural density rho or some long uh, uh, chaotic trajectory x of t. In low dimensions, like Lorentz, I'm able to plot rho of x just through some histogram. In a high dimensional system like turbulence, this is completely intractable. The state space is infinite dimensional. On the other hand, I can use some long turbulent trajectory. Again, in Lorentz, that's fine. In a turbulent setting, these long trajectories are astronomically large. Um, the Johns Hopkins data set, for instance, is hundreds of terabytes of data. And so if you want to compute these time averages and then change your parameters and compute them again, you're just sort of out of luck to do this practically. So our goal for today 
is to develop a method for representing these chaotic measures and their action on observables in a way that is feasible to store and then compute with, easy to manipulate. Uh, okay, so luckily we're not starting from scratch. Um, there is a subset of chaotic systems in which this process has sort of already been done for us. And this is axiom A chaos. So these are chaotic systems with the following property that the chaotic trajectory is always infinitesimally close to a periodic orbit. So I'm plotting an example of a periodic orbit here on the left in the uh, Lorentz system. Um, these are very special configurations of your system that perfectly repeat after some time capital TP. They describe basically one characteristic motion of your system, and they show only that motion indefinitely far forward in time. And so what this property tells us is that if you give me some chaotic point, I can find a periodic orbit that it is infinitesimally close to in the state space. As long as our evolution equation is differentiable, I can then you can then show that the chaotic trajectory will follow this periodic orbit for some uh, interval of time. Any two trajectories in a chaotic system will diverge, so will these two. That's fine. I can take that endpoint once it gets too far, find another orbit it's close to, and do the same process again. Uh, so these intervals in which the state of the chaotic system and its time evolution are well described by a periodic orbit is called a shadowing interval. We say that chaos shadows the periodic orbit in this interval of time. Uh, and this gives us a very nice perspective with which to chart our state space. So if you so think- all the, all Yes. All the chaotic we have for, for, say it again? Yeah. And so that's kind of the, the powerful statement of axiom A chaos. And then we're going to throw that away to look at turbulence. So it's a really nice property. It makes axiom A systems so nice to work with, gives us this nice perspective. And then we're going to not have that anymore and try our best to bring this perspective to turbulence. It's going to be kind of the, let's go with him then you. Is axiom A the same thing as uniform that has a ball? Uh, yes. I think uniform hyperbolicity is a property, one of the requirements of axiom A systems. You also require your state space to, or your attractor to be compact. And so the both of those two things then implies axiom A. I think what I'm asking is that those systems may not have attractors to it. So uh, the question is that whether attractor size space space is important for them. Having a compact attractor is very important. Um, so the whole attractor is the compact attractor. That's right. It's a global, but it's local points on the face of the attractor. You don't have fixed points, right? Um, so as an example, the, the scattering, if you have three balls, I mean, there's like concessions you can make. It's honestly a pretty complicated question, but if you have three balls and then you scatter, um, things ballistically off them, that's an example of a system you can make axiom A, the Hamiltonian. It's a chaotic repeller though, not an attractor. And then they kind of folks fuss with that to make it work in this formalism. Um, so the answer is, I guess, probably. <laughs> yeah. Is the statement just the same as uh, saying the set, the image set of the periodic orbit is tense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So orbits are dense in the state space. Uh, and so that gives us a really nice, effectively like an atlas with which to think of the uh, state space. With. If we have some chaotic trajectory, we can begin assigning to different regions in the state space these periodic orbits that are finitely long, that we understand well, understand the properties of. And we can then think of the chaotic trajectory simply as this meandering walk between these neighborhoods in the state space that we understand well. Like you said, these period points are dense in the state space. And so it looks more like that than just the three sparse examples I was showing. Uh, but a really important sort of point I wanna make here is that when I was first learning this theory, I figured this meant that the chaotic trajectory was sort of a Markov process in between the neighborhoods of orbits. And I want to sort of dash that perspective. Um, there is no orbit that you're closest to when the orbits are dense in the state space. 
at any point, chaos is in the neighborhood of an infinity of orbits. And so the way to think about this is if you're familiar with um, Bowen's work in the 70s, is that any axiom chaotic system admits a Markov partition. These periodic orbits aren't the partitions, but they're the admitted cycles on that Markov graph. Okay. Um, and so this formalism allows us to do something very nice with the chaotic measure. Uh, periodic orbit theory was able to prove in the 90s that the uh, time average at observable A over your chaotic trajectory can be exactly rewritten as an infinite weighted sum over orbit averages. And so each year we just have the um, average of A integrated over one period of the orbit. And because this is finite, this is a really nice change to do. We sort of substituted an infinite integral for an infinite sum, sure. But each one of these averages are now these finite time averages, and they're instantaneous to compute on your laptop, effectively. Moreover, you can prove that this sum, when it's truncated to only p orbits, converges exponentially quickly to the true chaotic value. And so this is a very effective basis with which to look at chaotic averages. Yeah. It is labeling your orbits, right? Yeah. Why is it kind of the infinite? That's a good question. Um, I don't actually know. Um, I'll I guess I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. This, this oh, um, I mean, one thing is you have to assume by uh, uniform hyperbolicity that no orbit has a marginal direction effectively. So they all have to be in their own little neighborhoods. And maybe that's sort of the thought process. You can't have any like continuum, any interval of orbit. Okay. Um, so it's very quickly converging representation of your averages. These are very nice objects to work with computationally. Uh, because the averages are finite. Because it will come up later. Yeah, questions? Can we get an intuition for these uh, orbits? For example, like how do you order them? You can order them. Uh, is, is that important for this exponential? It, it is actually. So the one way you order them is you want to order them by the symbolic dynamics of the system. Um, I know that's not a very, I guess, intuitive, helpful answer, but uh, you find a representation of your state space, a coarse graining, such that the evolution operator is just a, a right shift, basically. In that representation, each one of these has a labeling of what uh, partitions it pierces. The length of that tells you its complexity, and you want to order it by increasing complexity. So is it the theory of the Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily monotonic in period. It typically is. Do, do you know, is it one-to-one? -one? I, I don't think it necessarily has to be monotonic in period, but for Lorentz, it definitely is. You will find that the longer orbits you want to push down in ordering. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this, like, uh, Svetanovich's work did build on Gertzviller's work. I think that was mostly in, like, quantum systems, and then Predrag brought it to classical systems. All good questions, yeah. So with the tau p, t p is the length, is the period of the orbit, and tau p is how long it's been shadowing it? Or? So that's what I'll explain right now, which is, this will, this, this, uh, logic here is going to get broken and turbulent. So I wanted to walk through how these weights are computed by periodic orbit theory. If you consider some orbit in the state space, you can seed some point on it with this epsilon ball of perturbations. Uh, you can imagine invecting that once around the flow, and that ball will be contracted along the stable, the linearly stable directions of the flow expanded along the linearly unstable. If you want to compute the time scale along which trajectories are leaving this epsilon ball, you can compute that as the period divided by the product of unstable eigenvalues of this Jacobian minus one. So it tells you the time scale along which trajectories are leaving the neighborhood of your orbit. This is just the average of all time scales across all your orbits. And so the weight of a particular orbit will be its own time scale relative to the average of all others. Um, as the orbit gets more unstable, this time scale gets shorter and the weight becomes more and more. Close to zero. 
Okay, so the, the, the takeaway of that whole discussion is that it's fundamentally related to the linear stability of these orbits. That's how you compute these weights. And you can you can do that because you're coming infinitesimally close to these orbits as you meander through the state space. Um, okay, and this is also very nice in terms of our example before of you know minimizing the noise of a Hoover or minimizing seizures in patients is that if you want to compute the change in an average to some hyperparameter of your system, you can do that really nicely in terms of periodic orbit theory. Uh, both of these derivatives here, the change in weight with respect to lambda and the change in average with respect to lambda, can be computed just from continuing the orbits in lambda. You don't need to care about chaos at all. You simply just continue these solutions in your parameter and update your average accordingly. Okay, so now our goal is to bring this to turbulence. Um, turbulence is definitely not axiom A, specifically because it's almost never uniformly hyperbolic. Um, nonetheless, there's been a large body of research that has essentially brought this perspective to a turbulent setting. Uh, so not necessarily just orbits, but people have looked at for the past three decades, different kinds of uh, time evolution invariant sets in the state space of different turbulent systems. So we have uh, equilibria, which are fixed point, uh, rigid flow structures. We have relative equilibria, which are these rigid flow structures that translate along some symmetry direction of your fluid, of your uh, dynamics. We have periodic orbits that we saw in Lorentz. And then we also have relative periodic solutions, which if you co-rotate or like if you, uh, in, in a co-moving frame, they will be periodic, but in the lab frame, they will look periodic, but have some translation along a symmetry direction. Um, and then basically in 2004, uh, experimental results came around showing that the turbulent flow itself in experiment resembled these low dimensional uh, invariant sets in the state space. Cut to basically last year, this was some work I did back at Georgia Tech, was showing that the shadowing property can also be found to hold in turbulence. So on the left hand side, we have uh, turbulent Taylor Coet flow. So that's basically um, fluid confined to this annular duct. Uh, and I'm plotting a cross section of the velocity field here. We have turbulent flow on the left, a periodic flow on the right, and we can see that both the state and the evolution of turbulence is well described by this periodic orbit over time. So is this uh, similarity limited to some regime parameters of time? Or... I mean, it's it's limited to an interval after some time the chaotic directive will leave the neighborhood of this periodic solution but it's not necessarily limited to some like parameter regime of the flow like some reynolds number the idea if you're studying turbulence and wanting to use this picture is that as the reynolds number increases the characteristic time scale you expect to shadow one solution for diminishes and the number of solutions prolif proliferates so in very weakly turbulent flow you're going to be at one solution for a long time and then switch and then switch and in high Reynolds number flows, you're one solution. You're just bouncing back and forth very rapidly. And you told us it's not period A. So how do I know there's there's a, always a an orbit that I'm close to? You don't, and that is the problem. Yeah. So in turbulence, it is not axiom A. We have no idea if periodic solutions are dense in the state space. Um, we are just sort of trying to find empirical evidence that this perspective can still hold. <laughs> yeah. So the period in the turbulent regime. How do they get period of flow experimentally? Experimentally? Um, it's very for numerical. I mean, if you just see the experimental data shadow is the period of flow is numerical. This particular right. example is numerical turbulence, but we also found it uh, in experimental data. Um, it's easier to, to plot the three dimensional volume and it's a little more convincing with numerical data, but we also found that. Uh, experimental data of this exact geometry also shadows these uh, periodic solutions. It's very hard to see uh, yeah, if you- You're right, observe the numerical. Numerical and experimental, both, both. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's been multiple experimental results. I know there's definitely from Georgia Tech, a group. Um, yeah, but it's, it's been observed as an experiment. Um, okay, so we do observe shadowing. So that was sort of the first half of this axiom A perspective. And the question stands, can we now bring the statistical picture to turbulence, right? So that's that's the hope here. 
Um, in 2001, Kawahara and Keaton were able to show that a single periodic orbit was able to reproduce the statistics of their planet what flowed within like 98% accuracy. And so this gave us a lot of hope that an expansion in terms of periodic orbits would still hold in turbulence like it did in Axiom A systems. Although later this was put to a much more rigorous test by Chandler, Crowsbone, and Lucas. And they asked if we take the distribution of dissipation over our two-dimensional turbulence, can we then take a weighted average of the distribution of dissipation over orbits, weight it by the weights that periodic orbit theory predicts, and find agreement? That's plotted here in pink is the periodic orbit theory prediction. And as you can see, they disagree by quite a large amount, particularly uh, in the large dissipation regime. Um, sort of worse still, they said, all right, what if we just weight the distributions over orbits by a uniform weighting, some ad hoc weighting? That does about as well as the periodic orbit theory weights. So essentially, because uh, I guess I should say before, in turbulence, it's also a lot harder to find these periodic solutions. So instead of in Lorentz, where we have thousands and thousands of them, in turbulence, we have about 10 to 50. And so because we have so few solutions, and because turbulence never comes infinitesimally close to them, the periodic orbit theory weights essentially hold no bearing. Uh, cut again a decade later, so that was in 2010, cut again to basically just these past two years, there's been a proliferation of uh, empirical approaches to finding a periodic orbit theory-like expansion in turbulence. Um, so both Page and Yalmiz uh, applied a uh, Markov model to turbulence and tracked the transition rate between orbits and tried to use that to find the weights. Um, the uh, leading eigenvector of that Markov matrix would give you a good guess for what the weight should be of this stationary distribution. And Page also tried something else. He tried taking basically this model where you have this weighted uh, sum of distributions of dissipation over orbits. And he said, can I just do an optimization problem? Can I basically step along a gradient until I find the optimal weights that make these two distributions over turbulence and over orbits agree? So those are sort of the two leading empirical models to date. Um, and so there are potential issues with both of these approaches. Um, so in the Markov model, as we discussed earlier, the transition from orbit to orbit really isn't a Markov process. Um, recent work that looks at the shadowing of orbits by turbulence shows that at any instant in time, there are multiple orbits that well describe the evolution state of turbulent flow, uh, which is what you would expect from an axiom A perspective. Sort of worse still, if you look at, because these orbits look the same for this sub-interval, but then both sort of navigate different regions of the state space outside of this interval, the average of observables over each of these orbits is different. For, I'm using helicity here. You can see that the helicity of RPO3 is 3.7. The helicity of RPO8 is something else. Because of this, if you were to draw the state space into these disjoint neighborhoods, where you're either in the neighborhood of one orbit or the other, your turbulent average based on these orbits is, is very brittle on where you define this disjoint boundary to be. Right? If you enclose this trajectory by RPO8, you're going to have something more similar, similar to 4.2. If you enclose RPO3, it'll be more similar to 3.7. Yeah? yeah. We don't have the right notion of closing right? Right. The, the metric. Yeah. And that's, I think, generally an open question in turbulence is what distance to use. Honestly, we haven't solved that problem, and I think I still won't today. But my perspective is going to be don't make the neighborhoods disjoint. If you're similar to two orbits, incorporate both. That's going to be my perspective. OK, so that's, I think, an issue with the Markov model. On the other hand, you have this fine tuning approach, this optimization problem. And this is sort of unnecessarily dependent on an observable. So they optimize with respect to dissipation. But then if you look at how this extrapolates to the kinetic energy of the flow, you find that the orbits have kind of a mismatch with the turbulent distribution. Um, and you would kind of expect this. You can make a very sort of like pathological example, which is that if you uh, optimize your weights with respect to the distribution of A squared, you're not going to predict the distribution of sine of A very well. And so let's modify our goal for today. We want to develop this method for representing chaotic measures, but we want the method to be observable agnostic and non-Markovian. And so that's what we're going to do today. Um, so we call this method the least squares weighting. You'll see why, I think, in a second. Um, but let's start with this onsatz that we have only p many orbits, and we're going to expand our chaotic averages as a weighted sum of orbit averages. Uh, this is a linear relation 
there's only P unknowns, which is the weights. And so if we can find P constraints on this system, we can solve for the weights through least squares. So consider uh, the time average of a Gaussian observable centered at X in the state space. Because of the correspondence between time averages and uh, spatial averages over densities, we can write this as the inner product of our Gaussian with the natural density uh, row. This integral we can just interpret as a Gaussian blurred copy of rho evaluated at point x. So on the left side here, we have something that's very numerically acceptable, a time average. On the right-hand side, we have this uh, invariant density. And so we're working only in terms of densities and not observables. So we're now going to plug this Gaussian at x into both sides of this equation. What we arrive at is a relation between blurred densities. So on the left-hand side, we have the blurred density associated with the chaotic trajectory. I'm plotting that here on the left. And you can see the resemblance here between this and the histogram we plotted way back in the beginning of the talk. On the right-hand side, we have a weighted average over blurred orbit densities. And so I'm plotting here an example of an orbit in Lorenz and the blurred density you get associated with that orbit. Uh, importantly, I'll just say again, uh, we have this observable agnostic relationship between densities, and it's non-Markovian. If you take any point x in the state space, you find that every other orbit, to some degree, contributes. If it's very far away, the Gaussian will fall off, and it'll be a very small contribution, but at every point, every orbit contributes. Um, okay, and so we wanted p many constraints on these weights. We've now found a constraint. This should hold for every x in the state space. So we've now found as many, as many constraints as there are points in the state space. Um, so we can solve this through least squares. We don't want to count uh, points off the attractor very heavily. We really want to focus on points on the attractor. So what we're going to do is take the inner product of this relationship with the qth orbit blurred density. Does that make sense? Cool. What we arrive at is just a linear system. This matrix A is composed of the inner product of rho tilde P with rho tilde Q. This describes the overlap between our coarse-grained orbit densities. Um, and because there's a correspondence between integrals in the state space and time averages, we can write this as the double integral over the two orbits. These are two finite time integrals. These are instantaneous to compute on your laptop. The vector B here is a little more complicated. It's the inner product of rho tilde Q with our chaotic blurred density. And so this, again, will be a double integral. One of them will be infinitely long in time. Um, you can think about this as the uh, infinite time average of rho tilde q when it's treated as an observable in the state space, as a smoothly varying observable. And so what we've done here is effectively push this difficulty of taking infinite time averages off into these, these elements of B. But I argue that's a pretty nice thing to do. Uh, because unlike before, when you had to store these long chaotic trajectories, what you can do now is compute these time averages for p many orbits. And then whenever you want to ask any uh, time average of your system, you can compute that from your orbit averages here simply by rehydrating it through this vector of weights. So if you want to take some long time averages and then store them on your computer, you can now store the statistics of your system in p numbers rather than 100 terabytes worth of chaotic data. So that's, that's the main takeaway here of this method. Uh, OK, so you can compute uh, this elements of b through some finite time average. Uh, the error in that finite time average will be proportional. Let's say you compute it to some time tau in the future. It'll be proportional 1 over uh, the square root of tau. But you can make that as arbitrarily precise as you want to. You just have to throw compute power at it. So I hope you're asking at this point, how well does this work? So let's compare it to Lorentz. Let's define the error of the method as the true average of an observable over Lorentz minus the uh, uh, approximation from the p orbits. We'll construct this p orbit approximation in two ways, one using our least squares weighting and one using uh, periodic orbit theory. Uh, I mentioned in the talk that periodic orbit theory breaks down for turbulence. We're in Lorentz, so it's a very good method for doing statistics in Lorentz. It's basically the gold standard for computing statistics in Lorentz. What we find when we look at this error is we plotted the error of periodic orbit theory 
computing the state, the average state space speed and the average distance to this fixed point. Uh, we plotted the error as a function of how many orbits we use in the expansion for orbit theory. We find this uh, exponential convergence of periodic orbit theory, but we find that our least squares weighting not only typically performs orders of magnitude better, but it converges in terms of orbit number much faster. Yeah. What's A here? What's A here? Yeah. That's just a stand-in for any observable. Yeah, so this is the state space speed. So on this side, we're using the state space speed, which is I plotted as a color map here in the background. And then here, we're using the distance to a point in the state space. Yeah. So you have negative. Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I know you talked of, you said you talked yes. about low dimensional systems. Still, I want to ask, yeah. how does that depend on the number of degrees of freedom? Do uh, you mean like of the state space dimension? Yeah. So so I, I, I figured over the uh, last week, actually, I'll kind of jump to, I didn't derive it this way, but what this actually is doing is a kernel trick. This is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that we've constructed. And they're used a lot of machine learning applications, specifically in high dimensional spaces. So I expect this to work pretty well in a high dimensional space like turbulence. That was really nice that this kind of fell out. I did not derive it this way, but yeah, it's it's entirely based on a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Um, so I guess that's kind of my point uh, is that we do better than periodic orbit theory, uh, converges faster. You only have like 10 orbits in turbulence. So this is really good and it should work in high dimensions. And that's, that's it. <laughs> In the interest of time, let's take it to the uh, coffee break, the questions to the coffee break, and uh, we have second lunch also. <laughs> <laughs> nice Very nice. Thank time. you. Yeah. Okay, so now the next talk is by Seth Muser from MIT. He's talking about detecting all viscosity in rotating beam seals. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think my clicker is working, so I'll have to use the bamboo stick. You don't mind? Uh, yeah, sure. If you have a, actually, this maybe this laser pointer is better. It just plugs in to okay. either USB C or USB. Uh, why don't I here the the clicking portion is working, just not oh, the laser okay. portion. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You got it. Okay, that's a better release. Thank you. Um, yeah. So. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I will tell a, a sort of a short story, uh, which is hopefully intuitive and involves our commonality of hydrodynamics um, about how to detect tall viscosity in rotating Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, so I'm a, currently a grad student in the group of Senthil Tadadri um, at MIT. And this is work that I did with him along with Hart Goldman, um, who's now at UChicago. Uh, okay, so first I'm going to show this suggestive image here. Um, this image to me kind of represents Hall viscosity. As we'll see, um, Hall viscosity can be thought of as arising from a fluid where the constitutive particles have some internal angular momentum. Um, and this will lead to linkages between uh, compression and vorticity. So if you have some fluid of gears with some angular momentum, and you compress them together, their teeth interlock and turn their angular momentum into a vorticity of the fluid. So that's kind of a microscopic picture. Uh, but generally, the way I want to set this up is just to kind of introduce you to the main idea motivated by hydrodynamics for how we might measure Hall viscosity. Um, and then I'll, I'll discuss how to calculate this from microscopics. Um, and it'll be related to a lot of these fluctuation calculations um, that were discussed earlier uh, today. Um, and we'll see once we get some Hall viscosity, how this will lead to transport corrections. Um, so I'll kind of jump right from the microscopics all the way to this, the hydrodynamic equations of motion, sort of smallest length scale to largest length scale physics. Um, and finally, at the end, I'll be a little more technical and I'll actually write down an action, which will link the microscopics um, to the hydrodynamics. Um, and we'll see where hydro arises from some land of Ginsburg. Um, okay, but let me just tell you what Hall viscosity is. Um, it's a time reversal odd 
response, uh, stress response to strain. So um, I'll show you a little diagram on a subsequent slide of, of what's going on, but I just want to point out that because it's time reversal odd, generically, we should expect it in any system which breaks time reversal. Um, and so we're going to see this, uh, right? I'm primarily working in hard condensed matter. So uh, I would say that the prototypical example of a system where you might see Hall viscosity is quantum Hall systems. There, your magnetic field is explicitly breaking time reversal. Um, and interestingly, in these systems, it's linked to um, a universal number, which is known as the orbital spin. Um, so we wanted to think about how to detect this in superfluids, which are compressible, um, and generically won't have this relationship where Hall viscosity is linked to some universal number. Uh, okay, and so let me just give you a sketch of our main idea, and then I'll um, dive into the microscopics. So the main idea is that the presence of a Hall viscosity eta h, uh, which will generically be non-zero whenever you break time reversal, um, will add a term to your momentum current, which flows transverse to density fluctuations. So if we have some vortex with the density depletion at its core, then this Hall viscosity, uh, Hall viscosity will induce this term where you can see some right-hand rule extra circulation around a density depletion. Um, and what we'll see is this will lead to corrections to transport. Um, in particular, I want to point out that if you take the gradient of this, so um, gradient of your momentum uh, current should give you vorticity. Um, so if you take the gradient of this, what you'll see is you'll get a correction to vorticity, which is like um, del squared of log of the density. Um, and we know a very special thing about superfluids is that their vorticity occurs in quantized values in delta functions at the cores of superfluid vortices. Um, so this will have some striking um, impacts on vortex dynamics. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, maybe the third. I'll, I'll let you do the next slide. I was going to ask you why it's grad log n. I would normally think the stop seed is like a uh, gradient of a velocity or something like that. Yeah. So um, maybe it's I'll, I'll show you uh, later on how we can see this from linearizing hydrodynamics. Um, and then even later on how this arises from uh, Galilean invariance of our effective field theory. Um, yeah, so this is a generally a compressible fluid. Um, so we expect there to be some variations in density. Um, okay, so now let me uh, dive right into the microscopics. Um, so uh, Andy, mentioned this earlier, but I want to, I guess, dwell on it a little bit more. Um, so the uh, viscosity is, is the linear response coefficient telling you how your stress responds to strain. And in a fluid, your strain is just related to gradients of velocity. Um, so you can make some symmetry restrictions on this eta tensor, the viscosity tensor. In two, uh, 2D isotropic fluid, you'll have three independent components, a bulk, a shear, and a Hall viscosity. Um, so the bulk viscosity is just, if you try to compress the fluid, it will resist your compression. The shear viscosity tells you that if you try to shear the fluid, you'll get a force which is resisting that shear. And both of those are going to dissipate energy. Um, the Hall viscosity is um, one that you typically won't learn in your like undergrad fluid dynamics course if you uh, took such a course. Um, this is a, a time reversal odd response. So what we can do is decompose this uh, tense four component tensor into products, tensor products of poly matrices just to make this easier to visualize. Um, so this is the Hall part of uh, this term. So here we're thinking of some string which is given by flow along these directions, um, these orange arrows. And the stress response is the response of this uh, little fluid element, uh, the force on the each edge of it. So here, if we think about uh, this fluid element, 
and we start to pull outwards and push inwards, not changing its volume, then Hall viscosity will give us some transverse flow. Um, and my earlier picture of these rotating gears, you can kind of think of that like if we have a gyroscope and we hit the gyroscope, it's moving transverse to the direction we hit it. So we kind of have a fluid made up of gyroscopes here where we're pushing our fluid and it's shearing transverse to that. Um, so yeah. Quick question. Are you maintaining this rotation uh, with external forces or is this all by itself once it's in the rotating state, it stays in the rotating state? Great, yeah, good question. So in the system we'll think of, uh, we're maintaining it by keeping the VC so, rotating. So, so you don't work on the issue? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, so say you rotated up some VEC and then you stopped rotating, maybe you dropped the, yeah, th there would be some dissipative way that it would slow down. Um, it would need to lose energy. Um, and I would imagine that's sort of a long time scale, but I'll confess that I don't actually know the exact dynamics. But yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, okay, so um, this kind of microscopic picture, uh, we can make it a little more formal than just waving our hands about gyroscopes. Um, what we can do is say, well, look, this is just linear response. We can, of course, write down a Kubo formula. So we can extract the uh, Hall viscosity as a stress-stress correlator. Um, and in the great paper by Bradlin, Goldstein, and Reed, and what they worked out is that actually it's even simpler than that. You can re-express things in terms of shear generators. Um, and in an isotropic uh, system where there's a many body energy gap, what you'll see is that the whole viscosity is just related to the angular momentum per unit area, um, giving you, uh, allowing you to think of these particles which have some you know, intrinsic angular momentum. Um, Okay, and so that's what produces your shear forces. Okay, so um, continuing along this microscopic lens, let's think about a microscopic system where we might see this. Um, so I wanna propose some rotating BEC. Uh, so we'll start with our many body Hamiltonian. We have just our kinetic term for our usual boson, uh, boson kinetic term. Mass of the bosons is MB. We have some external trap, which is confining these bosons. Um, and we're rotating it at some frequency omega trap. Um, so we're in the rotating frame. We have this extra contribution. Um, and then additionally, there will be some interaction. This could be uh, your standard like contact interaction for uh, bosons which are not charged. Um, okay, what we can do is just complete the square. This is some function of momentum uh, P y times x minus px times y. We can just complete the square, um, and we'll see that it looks like a boson in a magnetic field, but we'll need to give an additional correction here. Um, this is totally straightforward from just standard uh, transforming to a rotating frame. Uh, this describes the Coriolis force, and we get a correction to our confinement, which is describing a centrifugal uh, outwards force. Um, but what's useful is that by thinking of these as bosons in a magnetic field, we can kind of map this to a Landau level problem. Um, so what we want to think of is rotating very, very fast. Um, so omega trap is much, much larger than all the other scales. So we are in the lowest Landau level limit. Um, then the next thing we want to do is we want to say, let's understand this effective potential term to be the next highest order. Yeah. The uh, yeah, yeah. So they in in the lab they have control over this with lasers. So like a higher intensity of lasers will um, cause some larger V. Um, so you can make it cortic. Um, in fact, that's what we'll be looking at. If we have some cortic potential, maybe plus a quadratic, then we can control a kind of a Mexican half style potential here. Um, so if this, if this effective uh, potential is the next largest scale, then we're in the lowest Landau level limit. So um, in that limit, we have some 
our orbital motion of our uh, cyclotron orbits is constrained to be as small as possible. But our guiding center is kind of, we haven't told our guiding centers what to do. Um, so this potential is telling our guiding centers what the lowest energy occupation is. Um, and then we have some interaction, which we can add as a fluctuation on top of this. Um, okay, so if we think of making this a Mexican hat potential, then what this will do is we want a, our wave function to be a symmetric gauge Landau wave function, which has some finite radial extent. Um, and if we just do this calculation from earlier, um, we can just calculate the all viscosity. Um, and we can even do so adding in interactions by using the full Kubo response form. Um, so we don't necessarily have to assume that it's uh, the average angular momentum per unit area. But what we find is, well, we're able to get some finite fall viscosity. And it's just related to the radius of our trap. Um, so with the interactions, would you write a log in state? Yeah, so if, if our interaction scale, if the order of these two were re reversed, we might expect a Lachlan state it instead. Yeah, exactly. So say um, our effective confining potential is actually very small. So maybe we have a quadratic confining potential. We exactly cancel it out with the centrifugal force. And so our bosons effectively see no potential. There's no preference for any guiding center coordinate then interaction is going to set the scale. Um, and depending on your exact microscopic parameters, you should expect to get a bosonic block one state. So in principle, your theory can go from like superfluid to a lattice, like a vortex lattice. Yeah, you as, as you'll see. In one of the phases, or in principle, you can drive that phase transition while doing all this calculation. Uh, I think we would struggle to do that. So. Um, Certainly what you could do, uh, what we'll see later, we write down a, a field theory where we expand around this kind of lowest state with some finite L value, and we look at the fluctuations around that. Um, but you could study what happens as you drive that through some quantum critical point um, to some other phase uh, where interactions become very large, perhaps. Uh, we haven't yet thought about doing that, but I think in principle we could. I think it depends on the ceiling, right? The ceiling yes. bars, you end up in the work of crystal and mm -hmm. fine tuning. Yeah, the RX yeah. parameter. Yeah, then you will get One, Once you decrease this um, confining potential, uh, where you sit, whether you're like Wigner crystal of vortices, or sorry, Abrikosa lattice, or whether you're some Laughlin state will depend, yeah, as Sergey says on the filling. Um, okay, but for this, <clears throat> that's the compare. Essentially, your vortices are all bunched up in the middle, and then the constant density is in the Yeah, yeah. So that's exa exactly. You can, people sometimes call this the giant vortex state. We think of having a bunch of vortices sit here in the middle, uh, which is clear. If we think of this as looking at the phase of this, it's winding as we go around um, by L, uh, if L is our. Um, parameter here. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to study the fluctuations around this state. Um, okay, so now I'm going to discontinuously jump from the smallest scale to the largest scale uh, and just think about what, uh, so I've established that there is some Hall viscosity by looking at this Kubo relation. Um, and now I want to think what's the consequences of this going to be for transport. Um, and so sort of in the spirit of, of Andy's talk, I want to think about some effective theory, just write down the legal, the lowest order legal terms. Um, okay, so I, I just want to write down the forces, which are uh, gradient or divergence of the stress tensor. Earlier, we wrote that in terms of viscosity. Um, so I'll just express them here. Uh, I show shear viscosity just because I think this is the more familiar. Uh, viscous force, um, but this will dissipate energy. And so we know it's not gonna be present in the superfluid, um, at least to leading order. You know, If you think of helium four and there's some normal component, maybe you have to include this for the normal component. 
But let's say we're at t equals zero, we'll throw out um, shear viscosity. Uh, okay, so then uh, let's think about what the Hall viscosity term is doing. You can re-express this by just doing a Helmholtz transformation. Um, and what you see is, I want to draw your attention to this piece here. So if we have some divergence of V, some inflow or outflow, which would be caused by a compression, we see that we're getting some transverse forces. Um, so we're going to generate some circulation under a compression. Um, okay, so now uh, let me make this edge argument a little more precise by linearizing my hydrodynamics. I know that conservation of particle number uh, will give me this nonlinear equation. Partial T N is minus uh, div N V. Um, and what I can do is just linearize this. So I'll have some average N um, and I can linearize about that. Uh, it is the same as this form where I put it in terms of log N if I, again, linearize this logarithm about some average density n bar. Um, okay, so if I just substitute this in, uh, into this force term, then I'll get uh, a minus partial t log of n. Uh, and then I know that my force is equal to my time derivative of a mom momentum current. So I can just drop this partial t, and I'll see this will lead in the linearized theory to this extra edge term. Um, so that's kind of reasoning from linearized theory uh, for this extra edge term. Excuse me? Yeah. What was your background here relative to the arrow? Yeah. So here I'm thinking of a, of a stationary background, which is cheating a little bit because I should add a magnetic field in my background, like my I'm rotating. Um, so I want to add some finite uh, A term. So V is equal to A plus delta V. Um, I, I thought more about the density. So what is your background density? Ah, uh, yeah. So my background density is some average n bar. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a constant. Constant. Yeah. So you are taking not quick enough to create forces. Or this is I'm what? Yeah. Sort of what I'm thinking of is I'm thinking of zooming in to my condensate, um, and having a roughly constant density in some region where I can generate vortices whose coherence length is, is small relative to the width of my uh, strip. So is this constant density capital omega by some velocity rotation So is the density created by rotation the background? Um, yeah, I think in general, for, for these types of rotating systems, they can't screen the vorticity so you end up having this relation that you point out. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, let, let's just think about um, what will happen if we say have a point vortex. So if we have some point vortex, it has characteristic size um, of the coherence length. Um, and we know that its density goes to zero at the center of the vortex. Um, so we're necessarily going to have to have this density gradient, which will add an extra edge term to our vortex. And the key point I want to make is that this edge term has the same sign, whether this is a minus or a plus vortex. Um, so if we think about our, uh, the situation where we have a vortex and anti-vortex pair, so let's have one vortex, which is um, this is moving counterclockwise, so positively signed, and another negatively signed vortex. So if we throw out Hall viscosity, what will the dynamics of these things be? They just get advected in each other's flow. Um, so if we think about the momentum current due to this vortex on this vortex, there's some swirling around here. And at the core of this vortex, that swirling is pushing it in this direction, indicated by the black arrow. Uh, and similarly, we see that this other vortex is pushing this one in this direction. Um, so a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair without Hall viscosity will just propagate in a straight line, which is perpendicular to its uh, dipole moment between the two. Um, but now we have this extra edge term, which adds, enhances um, the flow around this bottom one, 
and decreases the vorticity around the top one. So uh, the action of this vortex on this one now pushes it faster, and this one is slowed down. So the dipole pair is going to rotate. Um, okay. And, uh, oh, the reason we want to do something like this is because in the BEC systems, they can image the density very well by doing absorption imaging. And so they can see vortices really well as density depletions in their system, but they're not actually able to access the momentum current. So we could say there's this extra edge momentum current, but they don't have access to that. So we want to propose some effect on these density depletions, um, which are the vortices. Okay, so I argued this. Let me just show you a simulation of the landau ginsberg equations of motion for no Hall viscosity. Uh, this is also known as the gross pitovetsky equation, um, if people are familiar with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize my vortices here. I'm going to track them with these little white dots. Their core size is around one uh, coherence length. Um, and there's some transient where they expel excess density, but you see that they just propagate along the straight line. Um, and you can also see they're rotating because some density fluctuations will swirl around them. So I'll just play that uh, one more time. Um, there they go. Uh, and this center of mass is perfectly straight. Um, so now if I have some non-zero Hall viscosity, I can do the same argument. Um, and I'll explain the big difference in density here uh, in a little. But you see that this starts to curve. This trajectory. Um, is off this straight line. And maybe I should have included the straight line in my plot. But um, so th it is indeed having the effect that we predicted um, with this land of Ginsburg. Okay. So, sorry. How do you implement so first the self gross PIS like or, or yeah, that, how do you implement all this positive gain? That that's an excellent question. Um, so let me now link up the microscopics and the effective. Yeah. Is this like observably different than if the vortices were asymmetric? Were yeah. So the, the key, that is a great, great question. Yeah. So in a standard fluid like water, there's nothing stopping you from having asymmetric vortices. One vortex with circulation, which is a little more than this vortex. And generally, they'll exactly do this. They'll rotate um, as you've seen. In a superfluid, um, the uh, current is given by a gradient of an angle. And so we have actually quantized vorticity. So in general, you should expect exact matching. You have either plus one or minus one. Uh, you could also have plus two or minus two, but those are energetically very unfavorable. So in general, you should just expect plus one or minus one. Um, so in a superfluid, you will always see this exact matching. Yeah, uh, I guess, could you, like, uh, you have a magnetic field, right? So could you send it in the other direction? Probably see it curve the other way. Yes, yes, that is, yeah, so, so in a magnetic field, uh, if you reverse the sign of the magnetic field, the Hall viscosity will reverse sign. Um, and your system with Hall viscosity has PT symmetry. Um, so it would just reflect over this line. Right. Um, and if you subtracted those two, what, what shape would that, would that just be a constant offset or like when you're going? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, let me see if I understand. Are you saying, so do the experiment with one sign of the magnetic field, then do it again with the other sign? Um, yeah, so you'd see the trajectories. One would go this way, one would go this way. Um, and the average of their two would just be the, the trajectory with no magnetic field. Yeah, and their difference would uh, grow linearly or something, or? Yeah, so their difference um, would, I think, I think there's a quadratic dependence, which we'll point out later. Um, yeah, okay, so we want to write down the action, and this is actually very similar to a, uh, 
a theory of a P plus IP superfluid um, written down by Sun and collaborators, one of whom is in the audience. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to start from our squeeze BEC, where we have some average angular momentum per particle. Um, and think of this as some lowest Landau level superfluid. Uh, if we think of living in our subspace of the Hilbert space, where our particles have this angular momentum enforced by the trap, then they'll be charged under SO2 rotations. And the same way a particle which is charged under U1 number conservation is coupled to a gauge field AMU, ENM gauge field, we'll need to couple them to a gauge field for SO2 rotations. This is just the spin connection. Um, so this leads to a, a Wen Z term. Um, Okay, so we can write out, uh, generically, our action looks very similar to your standard superfluid action, where this is the phase variable of your superfluid, uh, and you have your number density variable. Um, but the difference is we have to add in this extra spin connection term to make our um, covariant derivatives correctly uh, invariant under this SO2 rotation. Um, but as was pointed out uh, in Sun's paper, which I should have referenced here in from 2014, this action is not actually Galilean invariant. So in general, if we think far away from any, um, far away from the confining potential, we might expect some Galilean invariance in the fluid. Uh, and what we need to add is exactly this kind of gyromagnetic term. This term should physically make sense. If we have particles with some average angular momentum per particle, they'll couple with their angular momentum, momentum density dot B. Um, so it makes sense that we add such a term. So this G is just a term, right? In the end, you are going to set it to flat. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so actually, when we derive the Landau-Ginsberg equations of motion, in order to derive the equation of motion for momentum current, uh, so conservation of momentum equation, you need to vary with respect to G, but at the end, you set it to flat. Um, but actually, to see this edge term that I've been talking about, you don't even need um, to do that, because in Galilean systems, you can get away with not having to vary with respect to G to find the momentum current. You always know that the momentum current is proportional to the number curve, because each particle carries some mass MD. Um, and so you can just vary with respect to AI. Uh, but then this gyromagnetic term, you'll see that you have a curl of AI. You just take that derivative, integrate by parts, put it onto N, um, and you'll find exactly this gyromagnetic term. So it actually arises from Galilean invariance and is true beyond the mean field level. Um, so if you wanted to do like uh, correlators or something, you, you should expect this to hold generally. But it is possible that it will be zero in experiment. Uh, yeah, problem. indeed, indeed. So if this eta h term is zero, if you haven't broken time reversal, then then this won't appear um, in your momentum current. So do you have any intuitions of like why that could be zero like you said that because in the sense that you have just put it put something at a hydrodynamic level and then you're looking at the other overall consequences. But from microscopic to macroscopic, it might just disappear into this one. I think generally, if you're breaking time reversal, you should expect to have some eta h, but it may not be universal. Um, so if you break it explicitly, like in a compressible fluid, it's not pinned to some universal like integer, um, as in the quantum Hall systems. Um, yeah, but. There are times, even when you break time reversal, where this is zero, depending on your geometry. So say, instead of having a Mexican hat squeezing potential, I just had a parabolic one. The state I condense into is a zero angular momentum ground state. So I should expect no, my bosons don't have any angular momentum. Um, okay, so I'm getting close to my time. So let me just say, uh, we can work out by doing the variations with respect to the metric, uh, all of these equations of motion. Um, and we find that far away from the core of a vortex, even with uh, Hall viscosity, we have some correction to the de density. Um, and thus we get some edge term correction to the velocity, 
which scales like one over the distance squared between the vortices. Um, and okay, this is just some technical details about simulating these things. When you simulate the GPE, you can have vortices which are truly topological defects because um, you simulate psi, this phase field, and the phase variable describes the momentum current. Here we derive equations of motion in terms of density and velocity. So uh, we have a hard time dealing with the velocity uh, divergence at the center of the vortex core. So we have to do some regularization by dealing with lambo seen vortices. Uh, but in general, these approach the correct things in the limit. Um, so we can do lambo seen, which look exactly like the profiles of normal vortices. Uh, but for numerical stability, we usually introduce some uh, finite width. Okay, and I'll, you've seen this simulation already. Uh, so how to generate this? You'll hear a talk, talk on Wednesday by my old uh, undergrad advisor, William Irvine. Um, in his group, I did some work dragging hydrofoils in, in uh, non-hall viscosity, non-time reversal broken superfluids, and found that you can pop off these vortices just like you would for an airfoil on air. So uh, there should be some way to controllably generate these, and you might be able to controllably generate a plus and minus vortex. Um, the vortex shading is due to compressibility of the fluid. Yes. That, so this is actually the, the interesting result here. Um, pester William about this, maybe. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, in, in an ordinary fluid like air, vortex shedding is driven by viscosity, which causes boundary layer separation. There's no viscosity here. So it actually ends up being due to like some shock wave. Like you're exceeding the speed of sound in the superfluid around the tail, and you nucleate because of that. So we had some numerical explanation for this, uh, which agrees with what I just told you pretty well. Um, okay, you can also look near sound waves to see some correct other corrections to transport, but I think the vortices are the coolest thing. Um, so, oh yes, of course, I want to thank my collaborators who are great and without whom um, I wouldn't have been able to do this work. In particular, Hart was very helpful with the effective field theory uh, description. Um, and to Richard Fletcher and Martin Swirling, who we were kind of bouncing ideas off of. Uh, so yeah, that's my talk. All viscosity looks like angular momentum for unit area. We're thinking about controlling it via Mexican hat potential. Um, and this would lead to some edge current, which should change the behavior of anti vortex, anti-vortex here. Um, and I think I've run a little over time, so I apologize to Jed. You started out, you built some stuff. Okay. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> Any questions? Why? Yeah. So, how do you uh, simulate velocity diagonal with, with all these problems? So, yeah, I just actually simulate the equations of motion for density and velocity that we get from the action I wrote down. Um, so, the paper you had with Sun actually in 2014, yeah. we basically have the same equations of motion. So, we just simulate those with a Runge Kata scheme. To numerically integrate. Um, you, you, so you, you know, like, I exactly. Yeah, that's why we have trouble with the diverging velocity because we're dealing with density and velocity rather than this base or this field side. Right. And what do you put for the orbital angular momentum? Yeah, so I here I just picked some small value. Um, so this number is supposedly changes with the feeling. As you change the width of the trap, you're changing the average and going into. So I have a question. So in the so you so you can have be in a regime where you're not in a Landau level, you can just be rotating the EC and then yes. you get into a Landau level regime. So do you have any prediction of if the if you observe not in a Landau level? Yeah, if you are in not in a Landau level and then you enter the Landau level, how does this uh, asymmetry between the vortices changed? Yeah, it's a good question. So generally, I feel like from a symmetry point of view, as long as you've broken time reversal, you might have some contribution. But it could be quantized could, versus not universal. Yeah, yeah. I think the closer you are to Hall, um, probably the more quantized you're likely to be. 
but your calculations are within the Lambda framework or it's general? We're, we're within there, but we've added fluctuations, so it's no longer um, incompressible. Okay. So we wouldn't expect a universal value. Okay. Yeah. Just a question for everybody. Yeah. So what happens if you make a whole system in yeah, so we we thought about this. So uh, I think my expectation is you would add some non-universal piece to the to the um, shift or the orbital spin. Um, so anytime you're explicitly breaking time reversal, you might expect to um, add some non-universal piece. Um, like a P plus IP is spontaneously broken, so it's some universal piece. Yeah, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Okay, so the final talk of the day is like back to the theme of the day, which is electron hyperdynamics and to be given by Jake Pixley from Rutgers on twisted nodal superconductors. Thank you. Uh, thanks for staying uh, to the end. And uh, apologies if this is a little far afield from what everybody else has been talking about. I'm sure, I'm asking you to speak about this. And hope <laughs> that everybody's interested in this. Um, and apologies for missing the morning session. It's a little family emergency there. Um, okay, so let me just start by thanking everybody who uh, did this work with me. This is really driven by Pavel Volkov, who was a group postdoc at Rutgers. Um, me and him started thinking a lot about twisting superconductors, and we got my postdoc group now uh, at LSU, and my student Kevin involved, and now Kevin's really working on this uh, full time. And around a similar time, Philip Kim's group started twisting superconductors, uh, in particular Visco. And Marcel Franz's group was thinking about 45 degrees, and we all kind of came together and then um, this new science paper on the experiments and several theory papers. So feel free if there's any more details to see these papers or just uh, bother me. Again. Okay. Um, might have more material than we need. I don't know if you get through everything, so you know, we can stop and agree on totally to stop. Um, I'll try to give a general motivation. I realize there's probably worth it in any more a <coughs> talks at all. So I didn't unfortunately provide an introduction to that, so bear with me. Um, we're going to we're gonna hop into twisting superconductors, and then we'll think a lot about two different regimes. The regime where, this, where the experiments have touched upon, near 45 degrees, and our proposals near small twist angles that I think are going to start taking off soon, hopefully. Okay. So. Um, okay. So I want to transfer these ideas of Moray devices. If you, these are uh, they're mainly graphene or transition metal. Like calcalgenide devices um, to realize something similar, but manipulating superconductors. So I want to take a superconductor and another superconductor, imagine twisting them, okay, to control the underlying B to G excitations of that superconductor, or to interfere in the superconducting order parameters in the two layers. You can get novel states, okay? So uh, you might say this is crazy, but if you think about graphene, you know, the B to G excitations of, of, of D wave superconductors are just Dirac cones. So it's really not that different than thinking about twisting graphene in reality. And these, these direct cones have been seen in laser RFS data on Visco. And also Visco is a Van der Waals material. So Visco has a Van der Waals bond between layers and can actually be uh, isolated down to a single monolayer. This is done in Shanghai. It's an amazing experiment in my opinion. This is a monolayer Visco in bulk. And you can see TC is almost the same. So there was a lot of years of arguing about superintivity in the, in the cuprates, whether it's 2D or 3D. I don't think you need to argue, at least for Visco, it's clearly two dimensional. Okay, so model layer of Visco and the superconducting transition temperature is almost the same as the bulb. Okay, so compared to band structures like uh, these semiconductor materials, superconductors bring us two different perspectives that I'd like to uh, bring forward, though these perspectives are, are just two different sides of the same coin. You could choose to look at it different ways, you basically BDG versus land up. Uh, and it's kind of just useful to think about different ways in different regimes. So near 45 degrees, uh, where the D wave nature of the order parameter plays an important role. So a 45 degree twist is gonna make these orbitals orthogonal. It was understood for a long time, actually back to the 90s, that the interference of these order parameters can realize spontaneous symmetry breaking, pyroversal symmetry breaking near 45 degree twists to lower the energy of this interference pattern between these two D wave superconductors. And I'll talk about this in Great, quite a bit of detail. Uh, and as I said, this has been around for a long time, but Marcel's group really brought this back and showed it should be a realistic uh, experiment. 
The perspective, uh, it's quite different, is it small twist angles? And uh, apologize, that's an older slide. And basically, the idea is bringing ideas of twisted body graphene to manipulate the BBG excitations of a superconductor. And so, like, here's an example of a magic angle of a BDG spectrum where direct currents collide from a quadratic band touching and come out. And so, I'll talk about this as well. Okay, so these are two different kinds of perspectives, though you could think about either one using the other language. And both of these are going to lead to a topological superconducting ground state that I'm going to convince you of uh, in this talk. Okay, so that's my general motivation introduction. Any questions? Feel free to stop me here. Okay, everybody's still with me, even though I'm not talking about chaos, this is good. Uh, all right, so this is a good old land out free energy. So I have two superconductors that are D wave. And as I already said, a 45 degree twist will make a DXY orbital, which are orthogonal. So there's no way that they can tunnel at 45 degrees with a single Cooper pair. You have to have at least two Cooper pairs to tunnel at 45 degrees, okay? So you can write down this general free energy and you can ask, is there an angular dependence to the coupling of the superconductors? And you're gonna be able to convince yourself right away there is because the D-wave symmetry, the order parameter, implies a, a sign change under a 90 degree rotation. So the free energy has to be invariant under such rotations, meaning the coupling of the two D-wave -way superconductors has an angular dependence. This is a purely symmetric symmetry argument. So now if we put in a phase difference between these two superconductors, we can ask, does this phase get spontaneously generated at some special twist? Okay, that's the idea. So you can write down a free energy. So your free energy has now the, the twist angle and the phase difference. And if you draw these free energy uh, landscapes, you can see at no twist, the very nice minimum at zero, this is now the phase difference between the superconductors, and your 45 degrees is settled with two minima at plus or minus pi over two, okay? This is a time where it was a broken superconducting state, and it appears above a critical twist angle, all right? And what's rather amazing is this is predicted to be a D plus ID topological superconducting state. So this would be a Z uh, index to the topological superconductor with thermal edge modes on the boundary. Okay, and this is in the vicinity of 45 degrees. This picture uh, is a little bit misleading because the superconducting gap is of course not the size of the bare and layers TC, okay? So TC of individual layers up here, but the superconducting gap is down, temperatures are down here. So you're not gonna see topology all the way up here. So it's just, you know, it's a nice figure, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so what are we want describing this twisted superconductor as? Uh, near 45 degrees, we can really think of this as a Joseph's injunction that we can control via the twist, okay? So how do I derive my current relation from my uh, free energy? I can just take a derivative with respect to this phase difference. Okay, and you'll see right away, I get this first term, the normal harmonic. This is the normal uh, Joseph's injunct relation, current phase relation we're all used to, but you also have the second harmonic because this can be zero at 45 degrees, meaning something else has to appear near 45. You can microscopically actually derive this uh, doing perturbation theory in that interlayer tunneling, which is expected to be quite small. And you can see uh, with the perturbation theory, this contribution is second order, fourth order, but at fourth, at this, this the second harmonic is all fourth order, meaning that two Cooper pairs have to tunnel. Uh, for this process to take place, okay? And I just want to point out there are other scenarios that could give rise to this expression. It doesn't have to be a D plus ID topological superconductor, okay? So all the experimental information that I tell you today will not discern these two scenarios. Happy to talk about that a bit more. But uh, these other scenarios that could give rise to this is it basically, if you take into account the fact that there's an angular dependence to the tunneling itself, there's an additional degree of freedom you need to worry about, and there's also disorder in the interlayer uh, interface. And there's another more recent paper I should have cited here by Resberg and uh, Steve Kilson's groups. But anyways, there's an interesting question of whether or not this is occurring due to disorder or due to the actual structure of this this uh, Joseph's injunction. Okay, so these are still open, and then we cannot rule them out. Okay, all right. Regardless of that, there are three sharp predictions. The critical current should have a minimum near 45 degrees. Uh, this second harmonic should appear in a fran pattern or Shapiro steps. I'll talk about one of these, I'll talk about the fran pattern today. And also the appearance of Tamarosal symmetry right there. Okay. So this has been a long-standing question. Well, will be open for anybody thought about twisting graphene. 
Okay. Can the second homology actually be observed in, in, in twisted visco? And the answer was always no. Okay. People try to make these interfaces for a long time. Uh, basically, it was understood that twists should probe the symmetry of the order parameter, right? So people tried to make these junctions, and here's the critical current as a function of twist angle, and it just looked S wave like. Okay. So it was really a bad quality junction because we now all believe that disco is a D-ray superconductor. If anybody disagrees with that, we can really speak up now. But we all now, I think, agree that the individual model layers or individual flakes, these are finite thickness flakes, for example, would be a D-wave superconductor, meaning that this, this has to be due to disorder at the interface. There's no other physical explanation if you accept that it's a D-wave superconductor in each layer. Okay. So then what so then it had to be a bit of a big technological achievement, which was done in Philip Kim's group. And what they realized is this all has to be done in a nitrogen glove box at negative 90 C, such that nothing can get in the interface. Okay, so here's an example of an individual. So these are not uh, individual monolayers of visco, these are finite thickness flakes. Um, and they can take a single crystal, another one, and then form a, a junction. And you can see that the resistance versus temperature, PC is of order the same quality as each individual piece and the junction. Meaning forming the junction didn't degrade the heterostructure, okay? You can even take a TEM image of the interface, a little dark here, uh, but it's very close to 45 degrees. So you can see visually the interface. Uh, one of these you're looking at head on and the other you're looking at kitty corner. And you can see this interface here and based on the resolution of the interface, you can actually bound the amount of disorder uh, in the twist angle of the interface, which is quite small in these devices. Okay, so those are really, really amazing, uh, beautiful piece of experimental data. This is temperature versus current. The current is ramped first to the right, uh, first to the right, and then to the left. This is why there's an asymmetry. And this critical current, and no twist angle, you can see, is dramatically renormalizing as you change the twist angle. Okay? And a very, rather remarkable, you know, the, the TC of the individual monolayer is, is robust. Okay? So you're still getting this superactivity all the way up to the TC of the individual monolayers. Okay, so you can plot this now. These are several devices, critical current versus twist angle, and indeed the minimum is observed. Okay, so this is a, a very nice uh, result, but now can we see the second harmonic? And to probe this, as I mentioned, there was two different experiments. There was front after pattern and Shapiro steps. Here, I'll just talk about the front after pattern. So here's our junction, is the two superconductors. And we're gonna apply a magnetic field in the plane, which is gonna make the phase difference of the superconductor spatially modulated by the interface, okay? And if there were no Meissner currents, then this thickness would just be geometrical, uh, but in real, oh, sorry, I'm joking ahead of myself. So basically, if I take a front after pattern, the critical current will have a special profile as a function of magnetic field, which is well known. Um, so if I take a simple harmonic, so if I just take sine phi, I have zeros in my front upper pattern and intermultiples of five or phi naught. Okay, that's that is this. Is, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So you have intermultiples of five or phi naught, and the other limit where you set the second, uh, the first piece to zero, so it's just the second harmonic. You have intermultiples at of the half integers of five or phi naught. Okay. And if you have an admixture, this is so-called node lifting. That's a signature that you have a strong admixture of the two harmonics. And the other thing I started to say is that we're, what we're interested in is this flux through the junction, and this can be solved via the London equations of the superconducting interface. And what you find, uh, rather remarkably, is that it all depends on the penetration depth in the plane versus out of plane. It doesn't depend on the twist angle at the interface. So this effective thickness is reduced because there's Meissner currents, uh, but it's not just also the air. Okay, so some something in between the two that should be twist independent. And now you can come to the experiment and you can go away from 45 degrees, close to 45 degrees with, with junctions that are very similar to geometry, okay? And so uh, here's the pattern. Here's the second pattern. And there's two, one conclusion right away from the data is that these zeros are occurring at half integer multiples of the one away from 45 degrees, okay? And you can either say, well, the thickness must have double, uh, but since that's obviously can't be the case here based on what I was just arguing, uh, then you have to take into account the fact that you're probing the second harmonic. And, and I also said there's Shapiro step evidence, 
which I don't have time for. Um, so we're going to jump now to time reversal symmetry breaking. So I've demonstrated a minimum near 45. I've demonstrated the appearance of the psychoharmonic. Uh, and the referee said that's very nice, but you have not demonstrated time reversal symmetry breaking. Okay. We had, we were not as, it was not as ambitious as saying it's topological because that requires a thermal measurement. Uh, but we were trying to demonstrate that time reversal broken superintivity. So how do we do that? The idea was going to be to probe a so-called Josephson, uh, diode effect, which may not be familiar with everybody here, but I'm going to go through it and hopefully it is by the end. But the idea is basically the critical current uh, to the right or to the left in the junction are going to be strongly asymmetric, allowing you to create a diode. And that diode is rather unique. It has no loss and has a lot of controllability of the diode based on temperature and all these things that semiconductors don't give you. Okay, so technologically it's pretty interesting. And so you can write down a differential equation for the phase difference of the superconductor at finite temperature, at reasonably high enough temperatures for this to be seen, for the damping to be taken to be small. And you then apply a current, either one side of the, you know, the, the current uh, sign is choosable by you, and you then introduce a basically so-called uh, tilted washboard potential for this phase particle to move around in this background. Okay, so it becomes a classical differential equation for a particle, and that particle describes the phase difference of the superconductor. Okay. Let me just take you through this, because this sounds actually rather confusing. Let's start first with no, uh, so no twist, so we're well away from 45 degrees. This is, actually, this is just a good old superconductor, no time reversal breaking, everything to the left and the right symmetric, as you'd expect. Now let's go to 45 degrees, where we're saying it's time reversal broken. Well, there's also no diode effect at 45 degrees because it's also symmetric about the minimum. So if I go to the minimum now near 45, to the left and the right is completely symmetric. So there cannot be a diode effect here. So this tells you that a diode effect could appear in a system with time reversal symmetry breaking, but it does not necessarily have to, okay? So we're gonna obtain a region where this diode effect occurs in the experiment. And that's just a subregion of the actual phase that breaks time reversal symmetry breaking. That has some, does that make sense? Like at 45, you get zero, but you know at 45 degrees, it should be time reversal broken. Okay, yeah, I might have made that point too complicated. All right, so now let's add in the second harmonic. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So when you add in the second harmonic, you have a minimum that has to be overcome. And if you can crank this minimum up, sorry, this local maximum up, you can acquire enough energy to get to the left and not to the right. So for example, if it's too small, the tilt doesn't get me out. It'll just set down there. It won't actually get to the left or the right. So I have to kick up even more current to get out of there. So the escape current is going to basically um, not be enough. And so these you get no diode effect because you have to get over the second barrier. Oh, that's clear. The idea is basically you want to make the, this first barrier with the tilt higher than the second. You can't do that here. But there's a special sweet spot of this Joseph's injunction where you can. Okay, so if you take these, this is an empirical statement about this, which is not true experimentally, it's going to have all sorts of effects like damping, so on and so forth, so the numbers won't so match exactly. But the idea is now, since this minimum is sufficiently high, when you ramp the current to the left or the right, that current is sufficient to get over that second barrier, meaning the current to the left is not the same as the current to the right. And that's this difference here, okay? And you can actually simulate this with damping to get a number uh, that's not 0.8, and that is really dependent on microscopic details, and you can compare with the experiment. So the experiment, I didn't get into all these details of how they do this ramping and so on and so forth. I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, but here is this asymmetry of the critical current only seen near this 40, 45 degree window. Okay. Is f of phi is something that is not that you are here? F of phi is the overall, um, Overall, free energy is a function of the phase difference. So it's just kind of, we're tuning it by applying a current. But, so, but to see the time reversal breaking, you have to do it this way and then this way and then subtract. That's right. You have to go back, you have to go left and right. Okay. And you and then you go and you ramp it and you, you have to be able to re recycle and redo it. Otherwise, so that it, difference will give you the. That's right. That's right. And as you can see, uh, as I was going through, the, most of the region doesn't give you any asymmetry. So the, this general lore is you have to break time reversal and inversion to get a superconducting diode effect. The interface breaks the inversion naturally. 
you're breaking the time reversal spontaneously. So this is a, a, a observation. Um, but yeah, so this is these differences. This is a plot of this subtracted difference. So it's zero, zero, and it follows what we expect theoretically. Okay. So I don't know. But you can filter out other three ones for the asymmetric equality. No. That's what I said. So, so all we know, all we know is this. We know there's high reversal symmetry breaking. I'm just being very honest. I mean, uh, we could not, we could not be. No, for example, the value you know, by which it's huh? broken is. Say it again. The value by which it is broken is consistent with your theory. Yeah, that's a non-universal statement based on the damping, and but yes, it's absolutely consistent. And the fact that it goes to zero forty-five matches as well, and the fact that this is several devices. And that's a huge error margin. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's not you know. It's an amazing feat. This experiment's amazing feat. Actually, the war uh, in Ukraine slowed this down dramatically because of the helium production. So this experiment took a very long time. Um, anyways, so minor thing. Uh, so uh, where am I? Yeah. Any more questions on this before I move on? Please. Sorry. So I'm kind of confused because you said time reversal symmetry breaking is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, you can have a time reversal broken superconductor with no superconductor diode effect. So is that a just a detailed statement, or is that because you're lacking some kind of symmetry? It's a, no, no. The superconducting diode effect is not. It's time reversal. It doesn't prove time reversal breaking. It if you see the diode effect, you know time reversal is broken. But if you don't see the diode effect, it does not mean the time reversal <laughs> symmetry is there. So let's say forty five degrees. We know forty five degrees should be time reversal broken, but the diode effect is gone. That's what I mean. It's just because for whatever just some microscopic reasons, it's too things are too weak. I think it's like a symmetry reason about this f of phi. These numbers, the IC one, IC two, have some numerical values, and and they set that boundary for that. They set this boundary over here. Um, but the time reversal broken state might also be. You know what I'm saying it might be all the way over here, but the diode effect just won't see it. Which is what we see theoretically. So we know theoretically that you know you open that you enter this time reversal broken phase, but you see no diode effect, and then you see the diode effect. It's really subtle, actually. Um, yeah. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Should I keep keep going? We're good. Okay. Huh? Okay. Fantastic. So five minutes. Okay. I'll go very fast. <laughs> so I mean we don't even have to talk about this. I can stop here. I don't. I, I don't it's a very different uh, small twist angle. Happy to talk about it. I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to be talking that long. So I'm just. Uh, okay. So let's think about this idea. As I said, if you, it's not that crazy to think about twisting uh, Dirac nodes in general. So let's twist the neutral ones. Okay. So where does it? Where does a uh, Dirac cone arise in D-wave superconductors. So I draw this out because I realize that this is not uh, it's not as common to your upbringing anymore. But uh, here's a standard primary surface for the cuprates. And if I have a dx squared minus y squared gap symmetry, I have line nodes of my superconducting gap. Those intersect my primary surface at four points. I can linearize my excitation spectrum around those four points. And in the NAMU space, I have Dirac nodes. Very asymmetric Dirac nodes because they depend on the Fermi velocity and the size of the, of the order parameter, but it's a Dirac node. So the uh, only thing that's really going to be different is it's not going to be the high symmetry point, which we will see that's going to be to our advantage, actually. So let's, let's try to play this game. So let's try twisting this at a small twist angle so that these nodes now are weakly displaced. And geometrically, you can see that there's going to be a low momentum exchange dependent on the twist. Between them, let me let me sketch this. Out. And you are thinking about this because you have shown that there is a two D, the superconductor of a two D. Uh, I was thinking about it because I just knew that there were yeah direct nodes in these D wave superconductors. I knew somebody was going to work it out if it wasn't us, <laughs> um, and you know people have been working it out since. So, uh, yeah, I mean it's it's it's. We it's didn't fun. know about this. We didn't know about the. Shanghai experiments, to be honest, when we started. I mean, those were more serendipitous for our, our cause than, than motivation. But uh, yeah, I mean, we just knew that it should should have a similar mechanism, as you'll see. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we want to now build a model. So in the Moray world, before you can actually do anything, you need to build a model from some sort of continuum theory of this incommensurate system. 
Okay. Sometimes you're lucky, like you'll see here, you get a nice low energy description, and sometimes you're not, and you have to deal with those quasi crystal like properties. Okay. So we have two uh, layers. This is one, two. And I want to now think about tunneling between these layers very arbitrarily. So I'm drawing brilliant zones beyond my first. Okay. And here I have momentum in each layer. I have a tilde for my second. And I want to think about this tunneling in all of real space. Okay. So T of R is defined in the continuum, but R and R prime are defined on lattices. What that tells you physically is that we can always assume that if I leave my first brilliant zone, the tunneling has to fall off exponentially just because those models systems live on a lattice microscopically. Uh, we can actually verify this for Chris principles and everything, but uh, it, it really is a true statement. And now what's different about uh, the superinductor case than graphene is that these nodes are not in high symmetry points. What that means is if I shift, shift my lo node location by a reciprocal lattice vector, I don't come back to myself. So my tunneling, if I shift by a reciprocal last vector, I go well outside my first brilliant zone, and it has to be strongly suppressed relative to tunneling inside the first brilliant zone. So the only approximation we have to make in the construction of this model is the tunneling restricted to the first brilliant zone, which is fundamentally distinct from twisted by the graphene, where these additional scattering events due to the high symmetry points require some non-trivial perturbation theory in the interlayer tunneling to describe the energy theory, even truncating it to the first brilliant zone. And what you get out is just this leading momentum exchange that depends on the angle, and you can then define this tunneling rate that's all dictated by the nodal momentum. And you can truncate the Hamiltonian, no, no approximation of the interlayer tunneling required beyond this. And we arrive at a really simple low energy effective model. And I moved away from those uh, Cooper Fermi surfaces. I'll come back to them just for analytic tractability. So if you have those Cooper Fermi surfaces, you have additional terms. Uh, let's not worry about that right now. Okay. So we have our original direct nodes. We have this uh, rotation of the superconducting gap from a twist. And we also have this interlayer tunnel. Okay. So you need to solve this model. You don't do any perturbation theory. And you find that there is a so-called magic angle, which means the velocities go to zero at a particular twist. It's rather, I think, amazing they both went to zero. That was not in any way uh, something we would have predicted. So here's this movie I showed at the beginning. And now you understand what I'm showing you. It's this magic angle of the BDG bands. So you're getting a flat boulevard de Gen band. Okay? So I want to get strongly correlated excitations of the BDG quasi-particles. Yeah? And I can do that now that I have a flat band with a magic angle, which gives rise to a finite density of states. Because it's a quadratic band touching in 2D. And as a result, this is all now due to interactions of the BDG quasiparticles, okay? Playing a similar game to twisted by graphene and charge neutrality. You see that you get a tyrosal broken superconducting state down here below a critical temperature. But this is due to interactions. We have no control over the state that's realized. And, and we predicted for Cooper to be like a D plus IS, though. In principle, it could be D plus ID, but it's very much dependent on microscopic details. I got to check. Yes. Are you saying that these, so I, I have my, my initial superconductor. Yeah. I have the BDG particle, uh, particle. And those form, is this, you know. They form a new state. Yeah. So, so there's a new instability in. Quantity. Yes. Okay. It's like you do a trace log expansion, and you keep the higher terms, and they, they, they play a role. In the BG excitation spectrum. Where is this information that you started with uh, D wave? Because you got the flat band, then that information is gone. Right? Oh, okay. uh, well, the direct, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the direct nodes of the D wave, I guess. The fact and that you I, start with some other, any other S wave, D wave combination, or any other combination, and then get to a flat band, and then you project BG. Okay, so be, I, I don't know how to get to a flat band in general, but uh, if I have S, I mean, I need to have some cones or something to squish around. So if I have an S-wave superconductor to the gap, I don't know what I, I do. There's an interesting question there, twisted novium diselenide, but you know, you're taking me off topic. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's interesting questions. I mean, absolutely. But here we need a node. We want the node to have control to make it flat. Yeah, yeah, it's important actually. Um, though we did this also for P-wave. It just needs to be nodal. It doesn't have to be D-wave. If you give the amateur copy, does the phase icon change? Anisotropy and the... Oh, interesting. Yeah, it'll change the, I mean, the values of these. These are not universal phase boundaries. But uh, whether this other phenomenon, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought about that too much. Um, but yeah, for P-Wave, you can play a similar game, though there's no P-Wave superconductor to, to propose, but uh, we've been thinking about them. Um, so you can get like Z2 states by stacking and twisting. 
How, how sensitive is this result to uh, the nodal lines being super flat? Like if there's some corrugation in energy. So here's one effect that maybe answers some of your question is these Fermi surface effects from Visco. You don't actually get the quadratic band touching. And you, you actually, this, you get like multiple Dirac nodes that are anisotropic and, and it suppresses strongly this instability. So that's, I mean, yeah, it's not clear. It's an suppressor, basically. Uh, good question. Okay. So uh, we just then played some, based on just like what's in the literature, you can kind of play the game and estimating this magic angle for Bisco. Um, it's about three degrees. Here's a 2D organic superconductor, uh, one degree. And then here's just a heavy fermion just for the hell of it. And uh, it's 14 degrees, all because the effective mass is so large. They can't realize this in modular form yet. Okay. But, uh, you know, give them a reason to, maybe they will. I don't know. But they're making MBE films of heavy fermion materials now. So actually, I mean, it's not an unrealistic uh, statement. No, I mean, it's very hard experimentally to do it. It took so compassion over 10 years to make an MBE film of YRS. So, no cheap. Okay. So now, I, what I told you before was getting chiral so symmetry breaking spontaneously. Uh, and we thought, well, why? I mean, I understand we all have an obsession with spontaneous time reversal. Spontaneous time reversal symmetry breaking in general, but why? Why don't I just break it by hand? You know, I'm, I'm trying to get a top loaded superconductor. Why don't I just create it? And that was kind of our logic, actually. So once we arrived here, we realized that if we applied an interlayered current, it would induce that phase difference just by hand. And if you now compute the the dispersion, you get a gap. Okay. Any twist angle, any current, you break all the mirror symmetries and you break the time reversal symmetry. You open a gap, and that gap carries a churn number that you have to sum over the four nodes. I don't think I have. Oh, okay. Very good. And what's rather amazing here is the D wave. So this is an interesting point. The D wave nature of the order parameter allows us to change sign such that they add. So had it been a different symmetry, they could have canceled to give you a trivial state. That's a yeah, good point. But we find that it's a Z-like superconductor. And this gap is of order of the interlayer tunneling, which is much larger than the prediction near 45 degrees. So this would be a much better top of the superconductor to create if you wanted to do anything with it. Um, and you can do this for Bisco, you can do this for the Bisco Fermi surface, and it doesn't really change much. It lowers this, this value. It's mainly be, yeah, it's just corrections. But the qualitative physics is the same. Okay. So let me just mention a couple of experimental consequences. This is a so-called quantized thermal Hall effect. Um, so, but where you see that is actually quite low temperature, but you see a clear one over T uh, pickup as you approach it. And you can, for example, see the edge modes in STM um, probing the edge excitations, which are these thermal excitations. Um, okay, so I mean, I just, I can end here more or less, but we've been thinking a lot about how you probe these topological superconducting states right now. And there's another idea would be, well, this is really motivated from our experimental colleagues. They're saying, what if I had a finite stack and I put one layer, that's what's easier to do experimentally. And at first glance, so Marcel and colleagues kind of uh, had some statements on this, but they kind of missed, missed it actually. And, and the gap is not exponentially small in the number of layers, it's power law, which allows things to actually come out. So you can now just start stacking these up and applying a twist only on one layer. So I have n stack with one twist, and that actually is like a topological defect for the whole stack. The whole system becomes topological, and the churn number grows with the number of layers. For example, your edge modes, now you have uh, six edge modes, and you can now just vary the number of layers and see how you crank that churn number up. Though, again, this is rather low temperature where you see that plateau, so this is pretty hard to see an experiment, but it's an interesting direction um, to try to get to this, uh, this limit where you start stacking and seeing this dependence on n. Uh, in this paper, I don't have any time to talk about this, there are regions you can get to where the true number grows like n squared, okay? There's a physics between one, 2D and 3D that we're calling it 2.5D, and we're unfortunately also calling it that, uh, but <laughs> but uh, it's very interesting uh, effects and it's kind of in between these two. Yes, please. So sorry to interrupt, but the, for the multi-layer thing, just the top is twisted? Just or? the top, just the top. It's really surprising, actually. Uh, well, this or this? No. But once you start twisting multiple, then yes. <laughs> you twist like each layer a little bit relative to the next to get like a spiral. So the chiral twist is also an option, and there's people have thought about the chiral twist for three layers. You can solve three layers. So the n layer case, you you can only solve if n is untwisted. 
uh but but the uh the alternating twists you kind of got to do each one at a you know it's kind of like stamp collecting you got to do each one at a time um there might be some general rules that we haven't figured out yet um but i mean like as long pull up and people are thinking about this and graphing multi-layers as well so we've been thinking about the super thing and yeah yeah that was really interesting so um yeah there's also the the the, the symmetric twist yeah so you can have a these be untwisted and the middle one twisted and you can like mirror eigenvalues and that's so called you know it's, those ones are very good super connectors for the graphing yes okay so let me just end there thank you all for bearing with me okay so questions can be postponed after i close the session because i have to pick up my daughter or something like that. <laughs> so but but we will plan as we go uh, so I'm planning for some dinner in one of these days, like Tuesday or Wednesday. So I will just stay tuned for any dinner time. So thanks. So, so that ends today's session and then we'll start tomorrow at nine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Are you, are you taking the train back, bro? Yeah.